might actually be the most derivative one of all. I mean, Christ, the same house. Maybe so. But you forgot the first rule of surviving a stab movie. Never answer the- I'm bored. Wait! And welcome back to Horror Queers. We're talking parking lots. We're talking cruising. And we're talking, you guys have a strange way of loving each other sometimes. And I'm Joe. And I'm Trace. And we're talking unsimulated sex, gay oh, sex. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I mean, is it appropriate to say content warning for just the sheer number of penises you see in this movie? No, 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 no. no. Because, I, I, look, I, have you been to a nude beach? Have you, I'm I sorry. Have. have you been naked at a nude beach? <laughs> I have not. Yes to the first, no to the second. Okay, yes to both for me. Uh, we have one in Austin. It was called Hippie Hollow, but it's like a beach in quotes where it's on a well, it's on a lake like this. Actually, Ooh, <laughs> was anyone murdered there? No, no. But it's like the way like the shore looks where it's a bunch of rocks. It's like mm -hmm. that's exactly how it looks. It's not a beach. It's just a bunch of rocks, but it's much steeper in Austin. Like it's almost a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, how appealing. Yeah, exactly. But I was, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> getting ahead of myself. <laughs> we are discussing, and I'm apologizing in advance for butchering this, Alain Giraudy's Stranger by the Lake, um, a mm. 2013 French erotic thriller, which is closing out our month of erotic thrillers, Joe. Indeed, yes. Uh, I mean, depending on your mileage, we may have saved the best for last. Uh, well, it's not my favorite, but no, but, but that's not to say it's I don't like. I actually I gave this a four star rating. So mm -hmm. yeah, this is uh, as y'all heard last week, this is a first time watch for me. I've been tr waiting to watch this for a long time, but as Joe will probably poke fun at me for, um, I haven't been in the mood because I know <laughs> that it's been like I know that it's a very slow film and. Mm -hmm. I was primed for that going in. So I actually, I didn't find any of this boring. I could see like if you were going in expecting, oh, gay uh, slasher mm -hmm. by the lake. Like, yeah, th that's not what this is. Like, this is very much um, like queer thriller before sunrise. Yeah, yeah, it's very contemplative, lots of beautiful scenery, but if you go into this expecting a murder every 10 minutes, you will be sadly disappointed. But that being said, though, there is a a dearth, is, is, mm -hmm. is that what the word? A dearth of, of things to talk about in this film. <laughs> oh, no, no, that is not the right way. <laughs> oh, dearth, dearth is the opposite. I'm looking for the opposite. Is the opposite. <laughs> um, there is a, 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 I'll just say plethora. There's a yeah, plethora there you go. of things mm -hmm. to talk about in this movie. <laughs> so much, yeah. This is funny because this was originally going to be the kickoff to the month, and then we ended up swapping it with Dress to Kill. And in some ways, I'm actually happier that we're discussing this one last because we've got the three weeks of erotic thriller history mm -hmm. and, you know, discussions behind us. And this one to me feels in some ways very conventional for an erotic thriller, but it's also extremely unconventional in other ways. Very much so. When did you see this for the first time, Joe? Uh, I didn't see it when it first came out. I don't think this ever got any kind of, I mean, you'll tell me in a moment, but yeah. I don't believe this ever got a mainstream release. So I heard rumblings about it, and I think I sought it out for a piece that I did for Certified Forgotten, and then I also wrote about it for Terry Menard's uh, Gaily Helpful. So I've written about this film several times. I also just recently did a gallery talk on it. So Jesus. this is probably my third or fourth time watching the film. Wow. Um, yeah, my husband watched this like five years ago, and he said he liked it, but he's like, yeah, but it's not one I ever want to watch again. And so... That's fair. But, but that meant I had to take it upon myself to watch it, and so I needed the podcast to give me that push. Sure. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So before we get into all the things to talk about with this movie, just, I mean, honestly, I don't have a ton of production, more so just what the director was kind of thinking when he was writing this movie. So this is interesting, too, because a lot of it's from his interview on the Blu-ray. Mm hmm And so a lot of his motivation for this came because he believed that, and he's using this word, homosexual life is often depicted indoors. Yes. In saunas, in nightclubs, and so on. And I was like, okay, yes, 
saunas, nightclubs, nowhere else, but yes. <laughs> well, I think what he's saying is that it often feels like gay men are trapped within cities, within buildings, right? Mm-hmm. Like you don't see a lot of queer lifestyle where it's like gays are just out doing their thing. But I think he's also suggesting there is a naturalistic approach to queer life. A hundred percent. And so, yeah, he was fascinated by having like this sh- by showing homosexual life in the outdoors under the open stars. Also, just as a personal preference, he doesn't like shooting in enclosed spaces, and he thinks Mm -hmm. that a lake and trees are more sensual than indoor spaces, which I mean, yeah, sure, I get it. I'm not an outdoorsy person, but I can see how someone who is would think that. (laughs) Oh, that's right. I forget. You're like really not a camper. So nothing about this movie would be appealing except maybe the anonymous sex. Well, okay, but that's the thing, though. Okay, so there's a sound of, I don't know what bug it is, um, but like it's, you know, when it's really hot and bright outside and it's just like that that constant humming or a buzzing sound of some, Mm -hmm. maybe it's cicadas. I was going to say probably cicada or that's the one that everyone is screaming at us. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I cannot stand that. When I hear that, um, my dick like shrivels inside my body. And I'm like, nope, I don't like this. I need to get out. I, I go away. And so to see these men just like fucking like on the bare grass, I was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't oh do it. God. You're so particular. <laughs> it's fascinating. I just even the but even the rocks, I wouldn't want to fuck on the rocks. I'm sorry. Like there's a part where, you know, they're just like, Oh, like right at the water's edge and they are fucking on those sharp ass rocks. It yeah, I was like, so are you un- not putting a towel down? It's so uncomfortable. You've already got a dick in your ass. So it's like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> <laughs> well, the fuck is what it's all about. Yeah, sir. I guess yeah, that is exactly what it is. But um, another aspect, though, that he that was really important to the director was he wanted to focus on like the working class uh, because he thinks that in topics of homosexuality, workers are excluded from those topics and so he wanted to show that yes sensuality and sexuality do exist in the world of workers and he says peasants and i is that a thing Mm. that we still say i was gonna say it felt particularly french to me okay that's what well even using the word homosexual right like how often do we say homosexual it should be noted he's also a gay man of a certain age so i believe he was 50 when he made this movie so he is of a slightly older generation so linguistically he might be using terms that sound a little bit more old-fashioned to us Ooh, you know what though i wonder he might have a more colloquial term that he's using in french but like the translation well, and subtitles just the more formal homosexual it is true that in france you would say les homosexuels <laughs> I love it when you talk French to me. <laughs> Wait until you hear me try to pronounce these last names. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, well, here, here, parse me through this, too. So, okay, so he, you know, he's like, you can easily get the impression that the events of, of Stranger by the Lake are a phenomenon that only concerns the middle class. But, okay, what mm. is this? He also wanted to leave, and this is, and I quote, the ghetto of homosexuality. So this is me putting all of these kind of context clues together where he's saying gay life indoors, middle class, and then also the ghetto. I'm taking that all to be, we often see depictions of a certain type of queer figure in cinema, which is middle class affluent gay who's probably going out to bars or saunas, sipping nightclubs, Mm -hmm. sipping sipping cocktails and uh you know they're they're very much like within their own sort of community whereas if you look at the people in stranger by the lake they don't know each other even though they are forming a different kind of community because it's exclusively men and nearly entirely gay men from what we're led to believe right they don't have this kind of like ghetto where it's safe and it's tricky because of course like particularly in north america the word ghetto is a racialized term so Mm -hmm. it's already making us feel a little bit uncomfortable but again i think this is a this is a linguistic difference yeah well and so i I guess that's right because maybe it's because like you know queer men the type of men you just described that we see going to clubs going to bars i mean oh actually look at bros right like how many people how many straight people related to that movie (laughs) (laughs) yeah but but so so what he wanted to do though with this film was talk about one of my favorite words the microcosmic world of homosexuality but do so um in order to speak about humanity in general and i think that's something we'll talk about as we get go along because even though yes this is as you said primarily a cast of characters that are we are led to believe gay men i think there's a lot here that speaks about toxic relationships and things Mm -hmm. like that that anyone can relate to yeah it's weird because in some ways i think that this is a film that if 
straight identifying people or even like anyone who doesn't identify as a gay man specifically Mm -hmm. i think that there can be some very confronting aspects of this film that are going to rub people the wrong way or they're going to say "Ooh, that's a barrier for access but there's also so much that can be discussed for both those people as well as specifically gay men like Mm -hmm. this film is so I don't know, like, I've long said it, I think the French are just kind of killing the queer horror game, Mm -hmm. principally because of this title and then Knife Plus Heart. Like, they are the most unabashedly queer and proud of it queer horror films that I've seen. Well, and how interesting to see them go from, you know, the aughts, where we have the new French extremity movement of the late 90s and the aughts, and Mm -hmm. to this, you know, which is much more quieter uh, type of horror. Right, yes. But yeah, so when filming, uh, they use a fixed camera for most shots so as to give a sense of ambiguity to the spectator, um, a.k.a. us. Mm -hmm. I do think this is going to be challenging for people, too, because there's also no score in this film. So, (laughs) you know, he goes on, the director goes on to say how it gives the film kind of a documentary feel, even though it's not a documentary. And so if you're watching this and you're not used to that, you might feel like you're watching some weird science fiction film. And I kind of like that comparison (laughs) that he threw in there. (laughs) Yeah, it was interesting because I was happy that we had watched Elephant from earlier this year because Mm. this feels like a French elephant in certain ways, right? Like, it is very documentary feel, but we're also focusing on using nature as transitions like, okay, it's a different time of day. And we're going to signal that because, oh, now it's dusk at the lake, or we're giving you shots of clouds passing by in the sky. Well, and that's the thing, too. Like, even with the, the lack of sound, I mean, sorry, the lack of score, like, mm-hmm. the, the sound that we get is the near constant roar of wind in the trees. Mm-hmm. Or those fucking cicadas. And so <laughs> I can only imagine what it was like to see this in a theater because this film does a really good job, I feel, of transporting you into the world of itself. Yes. Yeah. Everything about the mise-en-scene in particular is very... I've, I've long described this film as almost fairy tale esque so I was kind of happy to see that come out in the press yeah. notes for it. But also the weird lack or maybe ambiguity around time in the film is so interesting to me. Like, I can't tell if this is a film that's set in the 90s or the 2000s or if it's contemporary for 2013. And I kind of fucking love that because I think that's easier to transport yourself into. Well, that's all right. I thought you were talking about like the passage of time because I was like, well, well I saw that somewhere too. that it was. Well, because okay, so, again, I don't know where IMDb got this. Some idiot probably just put it there. But apparently this film takes place over the course of 10 straight days. Mm-hmm. Pun not intended. I saw that and I tried to count it when I was doing my notes. There's mm-hmm. definitely at least like seven or eight. Yeah. Of course, if y'all haven't seen this movie, we don't leave this lake for the no. duration of the film. So we never get to see what any of these characters' home life is like, which is crucial for one of them. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it's just a single setting thriller. Yeah, it's literally the parking lot is the transition. So whenever you see the parking lot, that means it's a new day. And then apart from that, it's the woods and the lake and everything else you just have to infer. And the parking lot's almost always a long shot. Yes, it's the same shot every time. It's just you're keeping track of cars, which to me, again, if we're thinking about erotic thrillers, so much of this film is about voyeurism and subjectivity. Oh, yeah. It's, it's it's not quite the definition of like what I call, you know, I spy horror, where it's like, mm-hmm. oh, we're just looking at a still image and like what's different. But the parking lot comes close to that. Mm-hmm. Particularly when you're like, oh, I'm keeping track of that red fucking car. Yeah. <laughs> Um, But as I mentioned at the top of the episode, this film does contain unsimulated sex. And I was a little surprised to find out these were body doubles. Mm -hmm. The actors cast. (laughs) Very well cast. I mean, truthfully, I I think I saw there's only two actual hardcore shots in this film. I know one is uh, Frank's first ejaculation. I don't know what the second one is. Uh, I also don't know. I I couldn't help but wonder if it was when we're seeing him get head by Eric, the voyeur oh, guy. Oh, maybe. Maybe. But we're not actually seeing anything there. Well, because I, cause it depends on what you deem hardcore, right? Yes. Because to me, hardcore is seeing an erect penis ejaculate. Um. Okay. 
<laughs> I would have just gone with hard penis, but sure. Sure. I, I, isn't that weird, though? Like, you, I guess the name hardcore, but still, to me, it's the actual act of ejaculating. Because truthfully, like, I was expecting something like that in this movie, but when it actually happened, I was like, oh! <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, it's it's shocking because you realize I don't ever see this outside of pornography. N- never. And so they did use pornographic actors for uh, as the body doubles, but here's the thing, though. The actors, Pierre de la Donchamp and Christophe Pau, uh, they are naked. Like, this is actually yeah. them for all their scenes. It's just when we see, again, uh, Frank's erect penis ejaculating. That's a porn star, a close-up mm-hmm. shot of that. So I was a little surprised. I listened to them talk about it. You know, I think they had considered having the actors just do the hardcore shots themselves. I think there were also going to be a lot more hardcore shots originally. Yes. But also, I guess, because, again, I want to use the phrase regular actors, but... <laughs> Just non-pornographic actors, actors versus right. pornographic actors. Uh, the non-pornographic actors had trouble, like, maintaining an erection. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess yeah. you would have to be professional and, like, know how to do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, because we always look at this and say, oh, well, how hard is it to get your dick hard for a couple of minutes so you can get the shot? It's not a couple of minutes. We're no. talking about hours for setup sometimes. So, yeah, uh, you need a professional. Absolutely. But then when talking about these scenes, the director admits, you know, the problem with doing these is doing them in a non-provocative way, not pornographically, distinguishing the fact that it's it's a question of gaze and distance. And so mm-hmm. the great difference is whether you stay with the mechanics of the sexual act or whether you connect with uh, love, with caresses, with feelings. And that's the thing, too. I mean, like, I I don't know what this would have been like to see in theaters. I know that they were expecting more pushback from a lot more outlets because mm-hmm. of the content of this film, but they didn't get it. And no. I, I, I'm curious to see to know why that is, unless it was like, oh, it's an art house film. I do think part of it was that for sure. I think there was also a big hubbub in the buildup to the release. So people almost walked in, I think, anticipating this. So they were less shocked. I guess, I mean, it's also, I mean, we're getting to it. It was critically acclaimed. So that yes. probably helped matters. Yeah. I mean, if it was a garbage movie that was just exploiting these actors for titillation, I think people would have been a lot more, let's say, less generous. Yeah, that's a good phrase. <laughs> the film was shot at the Lake of St. Croix in Provence in September 2012. It was screened in the Contemporary World Cinema section at the 2013 Toronto International Film Festival. I'm assuming you were not covering films at this time? I was in Australia. Oh, God. I always forget you had that. It was a year that you were there? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. that Your, your year vacation. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this received widespread critical acclaim. Uh, it's got a 94% on Rotten Tomatoes with an average score of 7.8 out of 10, an 82 out of 100 on Metacritic, and Letterbox users have given it a 7.2 out of 10. Uh, this was chosen as the best film of 2013 by the French film magazine Cahiers du Cinema. It also appeared on several American film critics' 2014 top 10 lists. So... Even though it didn't get a huge release, I, honestly, like it, it did kind of open in the states in January of 2014, but like in two theaters, and its right. widest release was 16 theaters, but that wasn't even until March of 2014. Yeah, like I'm anticipating that this is going to be one of our least downloaded episodes of the year, if only because this is not a film that has been seen by a lot of people. Yeah, but I hope the titillation, uh, the titillation of all the pornographic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> makes people want to watch this but again it's it, like i was talking about with bound last week it's all there it is very erotic it's all very hot but mm-hmm. the film is so much more than just exactly oh, the dicks yeah yeah and to me this is a really good example of a film that broaches that art house sensibility but has so much more going on like i went to see a lot of the new queer cinema because i did a lot of you know oh i'm gonna go out and support independent gay films So I would go to a lot of film festivals in the late 90s and early 2000s to try to, you know, like do my bit. And it often felt like, okay, we're going to shoehorn in a hot sex scene or male nudity so that we can give the gays what they're looking for. And this is me generalizing. It's not always true, but it often felt like it was at the expense of storytelling or 
we could just do a shit movie as long as we had something provocative in it. And I would say this is not that like this movie is using sex in a very smart way. And it is sexy and it is titillating and it is graphic. And those are all talking points. But the movie, as you said, is so much more than that. It goes back to that microcosm of the gay community. Like there's so much here that I like so much I did relate to and so much I didn't relate to. But I can Mm -hmm. also see so many people watching this being so frustrated with the lead character of this film. Oh, boy. I mean, the fact that this film gets compared to, once again, Hitchcock's Rear Window, as well as Antonioni's Blow Up, I was just like, oh, yeah, it's characters who quite literally cannot help themselves. It's like they're chasing death. And okay, so I, I'm going back even to two weeks ago when we were talking about A Simple Favor. We were talking about um, Anna Kendrick's different films. Mm-hmm. We mentioned the film Alice Darling. And yes. I actually watched that about two days before i watched this movie and i didn't know what alice darling was about <laughs> oh, okay so you faked it through that recording is what you're saying <laughs> yeah oh, i totally I, I just knew it was oh anna kendrick doing something serious like that's all i knew it was but okay. the whole movie is like this it's not a horror movie it's more of kind of like a domestic drama but where she's trapped in a relationship with a guy who is emotionally not physically but emotionally abusive with her mm-hmm. and how she goes on a trip with her friends and so it was Maybe not fortuitous, but coincidental that um, I happened to watch both of these movies within 48 hours of each other because I was like, God, like female and man going through very horrible relationships and just keep going back to them for Mm -hmm. reasons. Yeah, because it's not simple, right? It's really easy for us as particularly passive audiences who are just sitting on the couch watching a movie or in the theater watching a film to say, oh, well, this person's acting stupidly. Like, don't they know better? Like, in this movie, I have seen people react and say, you know what you saw. And then you went and you fucked him anyway. And it's like, yeah, because humans are messy. But it's, okay, but well, it, I have plenty to say about that. But it's also, like, one thing the director said, too, is that some people, when they watch this, they don't know if what he saw was real. Mm-hmm. But, well, that's weird, though, right? Because of the documentary approach. I was like, well, if it's a documentary approach, then wouldn't you think that it is factual, like, what he saw? Like, everything we see in this film is real. But I guess that's the science fiction part, where he's like, people can't handle, like, this documentary approach, so they think we're tricking them or some something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, even the amount of time that it takes the body to turn up. We keep getting these right. repeated shots of the shoes and the beach towel, and they're just always there. And it's like, maybe he just left. Like, how come no one else has noticed? How come no one else has said anything? And you start to play tricks on yourself. Like, no, I couldn't have possibly seen that. I must be wrong. Because I don't want to believe it. And that's kind of, yeah, like, honestly, like, when it comes to Frank, like, I get it where it's kind of like yeah you could convince yourself i didn't see that i didn't see that but Mm -hmm. also like i know plenty of people that stay in (laughs) shitty ass relationships because um well i'm not gonna use the abusive relationships but just people maybe that aren't good for them because they like the danger of it right oh 100 percent. and that's what this movie is all about it's the sexy dangerness and for me that's one of the key reasons this film despite being probably slower than most any other erotic thriller i've seen Mm -hmm. For me, that's part of the main reason why I classified as erotic thriller. It's because you know you saw something nefarious, something fatal, and you're still chasing the D. Erotic thriller territory, baby. A hundred percent, right? <laughs> <laughs> Dick's so good, you're willing to get murdered for it. Like, literally. But, well, and then we get to the end of the film. But, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I'm getting way ahead of ourselves. Uh, let's talk about how, how did this film start, Joe? Okay, uh, I'm going to bring in four different references over the course Woo! of this. I apologize, I've, I've done a lot of work on this movie. So <laughs> I'm going to reference at different times Liz Beardsworth. Her piece in Empire is a really good interview with uh, the key players. It's called What to Say About Stranger by the Lake. I'm also going to reference Richard Brody, his piece in The New Yorker, Silence Equals Death in Stranger by the Lake. And then I have smaller bits from Boyd Van. And Hage, his review out of can, as well as Michael Olishak for his review for Roger Ebert. Okay. Okay. So, Trace, you'll be shocked to know we begin with an extreme long shot of a parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, get used to it. You'll see it a lot. So, we see Franck, who is played by Pierre de la Donchon, 
he parks, he gets out of his car, he walks through the woods to a beach populated exclusively by men, and they are in a variety of states of undress. So some people are wearing some clothes, some people are wearing no clothes, some people wear sneakers because it's rocky. So, okay, back to my original question. So, um, you've been to a nude beach, but you've mm-hmm. not gotten nude. Uh, are these body image issues, or are they just, yeah. like, something body image issues? Okay, okay. Yeah. It's one of those things where I like the fact that nude beaches exist. We have one here that's actually a designated historical queer space in Toronto called Hanlon's. Mm-hmm. And I've been to it a couple of times. And I think there's something... It's going to sound weird. I think there's something comforting about the fact that there is a space for people who want to who want to embrace the body positivity or the naturalist lifestyle, right? Like it's not an inherently queer thing, although obviously gay men in particular do seem to gravitate to it, but it's something where I'm like I am not comfortable in my own skin enough to participate, but I love that for others. Says the man who wears a speedo all the time. But I do yes. not wear a speedo all the time. <laughs> <laughs> also that's a sporting thing oh my god <laughs> well you could argue that a nude beach is a sporting too if you're there to swim but <laughs> i thought you were gonna say <laughs> cruising is a sport i mean I, technically it, it is a workout <laughs> oh wow but no 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 so, so uh, the, the the area in austin i was talking about is called hippie hollow uh, mm-hmm. appropriately named uh i have never cruised there they are pretty strict like i've never seen someone fuck in the area although maybe they're going into the 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 thickets like they are in this Uh movie oh it's never happening on the beach like when franck and michelle fuck right at the water's edge like sure they're by themselves because it's dusk but at the same time boys the tree line is there for a reason like when that dude gets mad at them and he's like there's a space for cruising it's like yeah, there kind of is. Yeah, I, I, I've met groups of guys that led to an orgy at a hotel downtown they were staying at. Oh. But I know. That, well, that, okay, so, <laughs> this was really oh, God, mom, stop listening. But um, <laughs> this is really weird because like it was like one of those things where like all of us were standing around naked, and then like one person kind of got a little hard, and then mm-hmm. everyone Everybody started does. getting hard. <laughs> <laughs> and then we were like, let's go back to y'all's hotel room. But I also had like kind of a not a bad experience, but like so like on this lake, a, a bunch of people bring their boats up. And of course, you have some of your rich gays who have like not yachts, but like fancy yeah. boats. Mm-hmm. And they would invite us on. But one time it was clearly like, oh, they invited the the, the younger twinks because I was like 20 at the time. Right. Who were naked with the hopes of making something happen. So like uh... I went to go like get a drink from one of their fridges and one of them stuck his finger up my ass as i was doing that (laughs) oh yeah i mean like the 2023 lens is oh there's some issues of consent there but even just this idea i mean i think one of the things that i really end up enjoying about this film is that it does have a dialogue about almost like acceptable modes of behavior at the beach where you know we haven't introduced him but there is a fat character in this film mm-hmm. and he doesn't like his body because you you can tell that he's he's uncomfortable at least on the beach because he always keeps his arms crossed that's interesting so i don't know i wasn't getting that from him and maybe i'm being naive here uh and you're getting that from his body language but mm-hmm. i just like he just kept saying i just like the lake i like sitting here i don't like to get naked and oh like, my god trace <laughs> I- <laughs> <laughs> no i mean some of that could absolutely be true but the idea that he is coming to this beach specifically as opposed to going to the other part of the beach that he used to go to with his ex-girlfriend tells me that he is something of a boyer he likes to be around this community but he also doesn't feel welcomed by them okay D- yes to that last part absolutely i i i love this character so much i feel so bad for him oh henry it to me yeah. is the he's the most fascinating character in this movie mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i i will have lots to talk about whenever we get to his death scene spoiler <laughs> alert his death scene <laughs> oh boy yeah okay so i might get this character name wrong Part of the challenge of this film, particularly the first time you see it, is that characters don't introduce themselves. And you might be waiting like, oh, they'll, you know, they'll meet someone new and they'll say, this is my friend or hi, my name is. And it's not because part of the decorum on a cruising beach is that 
you don't always learn each other's names because that's maybe not what you're here for. That's okay. One thing I really liked about this movie too, because we will learn that that's a facet of it. Mm -hmm. It's not an exposition dump, but it is exposition during a police interrogation moment. And I think that's a really smart way of communicating that to the audience. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we may have completely differing thoughts on exposition dumps used during investigation cases when we talk about a haunting in venice on patreon this month Uh. (laughs) (laughs) because oh boy (laughs) we're dedicating whole pages of dialogue to that (laughs) well we're just stuck in i I was gonna say we're just stuck in a house but here we're just stuck in a beach so (laughs) Mm -hmm. different ways of doing it folks but yes um okay so the reason i said i might get some of these characters name wrong is because i don't actually know that this character ever gives his name but franck does have a friend that he will frequently say hello to occasionally sit by always kiss yes but that's a very french thing well i know because well there were a couple times where i was like i feel like he's slipping him tongue but no it just i guess it's just the kiss on the cheek I mean, they are very familiar. They seem to have a relationship that exists beyond the boundaries of the beach. Whereas with some of these other characters, this is very clearly their first time meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think this character's name is Philippe. Uh, If so, he is played by Emmanuel Dumas. And after chatting with Philippe, Franck goes for a swim. And when he comes out of the water, this is when he sees Henri, who is played by Patrick Dasumkow. And... Since Franck doesn't know him, Franck is a relatively social younger man. We should note that uh, Della Donchamp is a very attractive, not quite twinky, but maybe just on the other side of twink in terms of age. And this, I think, is actually very important because he has... I would say a conventionally attractive young queer body. Yeah, he's like, he's not a twink, not yet a twunk. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But it's it's interesting, though, right? Because do you think that he has low self-esteem issues? No, I don't. Interesting. Because see, I I, I kept reading that into as, as to why he kept going back to Michelle. Oh, no. Or part of a reason. I I think it's all about the attraction to danger, but also because, I mean, this character, Michelle, who is played, as you said, by Christophe Pau, he has a more conventionally porn starry kind of body. Like, he's very fit, very athletic looking. And as the press notes and most of the critical reviews for this film will note, he has either a Freddie Mercury, Tom of Finland, or Tom Selleck mustache. <laughs> I will tell you, too, the whole movie I was watching, this, I was like, this guy looks so fucking familiar to me. What mm-hmm. do I know him from? You do not. <laughs> Everyone, there is a French movie called Bloody Oranges that came out about a year oh, or two ago. Oh, okay major content warnings because it starts off like a christopher guest like kind of comedy and then takes a hard left about halfway through Mm -hmm. primarily because of what happens to his character when his car breaks down in the middle of the of like the country oh interesting okay okay uh it's funny that you say that because when i first saw this movie my first impression and it is almost entirely from the mustache and the vaguely europeanness of it He reminded me so much of Patrick Bergen, who is Julia Roberts' abusive husband in Sleeping with the Enemy. He's he's actually Irish, that actor, but the mustache and the facial features and just the overall build, like, so similar. Oh, I saw they, they had him shave himself, too, for this. Oh, which is interesting because I think it would have been not a completely different film, but it would have been different to have seen this actor with body hair. Well, hey, why why is that? Why do you think that would have made it different? Um, In some ways, I think it would have made him more conventionally, quote unquote, masculine, but also hmm. it might have been a stronger marker of what time period we were in. To me, body shaving is modern, quite a bit more modern. Yeah, mm-hmm. so this is almost like a transitional time frame where he's got a little bit of chest hair, but he's still, you know, mostly shaved. Yeah, I guess, I don't know. I, I got, I'm out of the loop with the gay community, I guess. But like, is, is body hair like, well, I guess if you're in the Twinkie world, <laughs> maybe body hair like isn't, isn't desirable. I don't, I don't know. I feel like some people are really turned on by it and others are like, oh, it's a sign that you don't look after yourself or you're not thoughtful of your partners. Like, this is, again, me heavily generalizing. There's probably a bunch of people who are strongly disagreeing with me right now. But I do think it's a bit more, it's almost like a visual aesthetic. Some people like it and others are like, "Mm, no. 
Yeah, much like how some people are really turned off by condoms. Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I said I think the film has a timelessness to it, almost like a fantasy fairy tale where we can't exactly pinpoint when this is taking place. Yeah. But the conversations around aids and condoms and illness there is a deleted scene you can watch it on yeah. either the blu-ray or on youtube where we go into the oh i'm not actually concerned about condoms i like the feel better i'm not worried about getting sick stuff to me this actually sets the film much more firmly in about the mid 90s interesting and yeah, that's that conversation too so truthfully maybe i'm like showing my ass here i use condoms but i've mm-hmm. never used a condom for a blowjob ever in my life. I I remember hearing people say they were taught to do it that way in sex ed class in high school. So like they would have teachers who would say, okay, like boys, you got to wrap it up and girls, you got to use dental dams and mm-hmm. people just being like, but why? Like that's totally going to change the, the mouth feel and the pleasure sensations. But it was like, yeah, you can definitely still get STIs from blowjobs and cunnilingus yeah yeah well i mean that's the thing right like yeah condoms is like for sure like okay cool you're not getting any kind of bodily fluid in your body at all i get Mm -hmm. it i've just um i've also i've never had someone ask to use a condom during oral sex i've had people ask to use condoms during anal sex but never oral sex i think a much more common practice but if you think about oh if this was at either a peak or just following a peak of a significant health risk within the queer community, this might have been more of a topical conversation. Yeah, true, true. Well, and it was really important too for the director because he was like, I feel like a lot of times in queer in movies in general or queer movies, AIDS mm-hmm. isn't really, you, you have, oh, you're, I'm worried about getting sick or getting a disease, but like conversations about AIDS aren't really had unless mm-hmm. the movie is about AIDS. Yeah, and and even less rarely do you actually see people put on a condom or like take out a condom or even like think of the number of times we've we've said oh are they using lube because most of us actually use lube in oh real life God. i'm honestly i was thinking about it a lot during this movie because we do get the spit in the hand we technique we do but... get the spit in the hand and i'm annoyed <laughs> i i am too i was like y'all bring a towel bring some lube too it's just like you're it's bringing bring like a cruising bag honestly and like I do love that there's this one scene where, like, we go to, like, lay down in the woods and have sex or or just fuck around a little bit. And they literally have to clear away (laughs) discarded condoms and wrappers and shit. And they're just like, clean up after yourself. Honestly, though, really, I I appreciate the education on cruising etiquette here. I think it's very, Mm -hmm. very informative. (laughs) Right. Yeah. (laughs) How helpful. (laughs) Okay, so Franck sits down and he gets to know a little bit about Henri, who mentions, yes, he he used to date a woman, but they've broken up. And uh, during the time that they were dating, he did have sex with a man. And this, to me, is one of the first times where it gets really interesting because we are talking about stuff like, how do you define gayness, right? Like, yeah, Henri is actually shocked that Franck declares himself gay because he feels like he's never met someone who exclusively sleeps with men yeah he's like oh yeah yeah, normally they always have a woman like it's a thing you do on the side and that i think speaks Mm -hmm. to his age yes but at the same time i don't know like i i I almost view henri as just more sexually fluid the, the thing is we don't we don't have enough information about who he is outside of the little bit of information he gives us Mm Hmm. yeah i mean everything is parceled out in this film so like you constantly have to wait for more information like i actually looking at my notes i realize i'm conflating two different conversations so the initial conversation is just i dated a woman we went to the other beach the conversation about how do you identify is their second meeting in the next day but it's one of those things where the characters are all so guarded and i think that's another reason why henri feels different in part because he is more transparent and open like at one point franck sits down and he says i'm just not in a good mood today and no other character is saying that kind of thing like henri is the only person who's honest about their emotions right Mm -hmm. okay so in between those two conversations we do have the introduction of michelle and it's very obvious very early on that Frank is enamored with this man. So when he walks out of the water, he looks like a fucking bronzed god. The water's yep. dripping off him. The sun is hitting him just right. And dicks Frank out. follows him. Oh, the dick is out. The dicks are always Dicks are always out. I know. Yeah, yeah literally. <laughs> I, I was because Frank stays in a bathing suit for the first, like, 
15 five minutes. minutes? <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe yeah. it's five. <laughs> but I was like, I, when he didn't immediately pull his underwear off, I was like, oh, because mm-hmm. that is the thing. When you go to a new beach and you need to get naked, it's like, it's just the initial like, okay, I just got to do it. I just got to do it. Yeah. And the second you pull your pants off, it's like, okay, all good. And, and now we are. This is, <laughs> this is just who we are now. But yeah, you know, it, it is one of those things where there can be a perception from the people who are naked that if there's someone who isn't naked, they are breaking the unspoken code, right? Because now maybe you're just there to leer at the people who yeah. are naked. And that's the interesting thing about the Austin New Beach, though, is that you would a lot of the older people would be nude, but a lot mm-hmm. of the younger people, the ones that were in college, would never get nude. And I was like, well, oh, that's really that's yeah. so fucked up. <laughs> And then it's like, oh, okay, well, here, let me just pull out my smartphone and tap one of the one of the apps. And uh, look, I can see your dick on here. Oh, and I can see your hole and I can see what you like and what you don't like. It's so completely different. This film is really interesting in that way. There's no cell phones. So there isn't any kind of distraction for people. And as a result, people also have to communicate or interact to get more information from people they may want to fuck or just have dinner with or go for a swim with well that's why with Henri, i was like god i get so bored really quickly if i were him like mm-hmm. <laughs> just staring at the water <laughs> yeah i mean there's untold stories about this character where you think mm-hmm. okay maybe he does just like it or maybe he is looking to dip a toe into more exclusively gay spaces or maybe he just genuinely does like the view and he just wants to come and enjoy his two weeks of fucking vacation see i actually think he's like constantly debating if he's gonna walk in the water and drown himself oh i could see it that is grim but i could see it i mean based on his final words it makes Mm -hmm. sense (laughs) yeah i mean he's he definitely i think has a touch of depression to him Mm -hmm. but he's clarity too Mm mm-hmm yeah I'm I'm wary of saying something more to that effect because he does tell us other things about what he's going through, like right. his lack of sex drive or his his disinterest in sexual relationships. You could read that as like, I've done it all and I don't need it anymore. Or it could be, I've done all that and now I'm not interested in being around people. I'm not interested in being around at all. Or it could be, I'm depressed and therefore my sex drive is gone. Oh, also that. Yes. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Okay, so we're pursuing Michelle into the woods after first seeing him, but he's already hooking up with somebody and it's very disappointing. (laughs) Uh, Eating ass too, by the way. Yeah, yeah. 69 rib job. It's interesting because the range of sexual activity that we see over the course of the film is almost all encompassing. Like we see anal, we see oral, we see eating out, we see kissing, we see rejection even, right? Like yeah. One of my favorite characters, it's... Oh, the masturbator? Yeah. <laughs> I, I call him the voyeur, but his his real name is Eric. He's played by Mathieu Velvich and... It's weird to say that there is comedy in this film because so much of it is straightforward, romantic, erotic thriller intrigue. But every time this character shows up and he just wants to wank while looking at people, it's creepy, but it's also very funny. Well, but no one is ever like, get away, fucker. Like, it, it's mm-hmm. because because that's just kind of a thing, right? Like, I mean, there's a moment, too, you know, where Frank is fucking someone and uh, he's there and the guy's like, get away, get away. Mm-hmm. Well, don't, don't you do you want him to watch like, it's fine like well, i no. and i'm like it's just kind of part of the area dude but whatever <laughs> it is but i can also understand why people might say i'm not here to be somebody else's spectacle even if sure. part of the behavior is eye fucking and following people and touching them like people don't say hey can i fuck you they, you know, like put a hand on a crotch or they kind of like graze an arm oh, across a chest and stuff. Do you, I, I, <laughs> I want Gen Z to watch this movie and be like, consent, consent. <laughs> oh, I mean, but here's the thing. People say no. Like Frank says no to this Eric guy repeatedly. Well, sure, sure, sure. But that the first motion, the first act oh, is sure. let me grab your dick. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's also because that is the rules of the spot, right? Like, you are in an area that is automatically inviting it, which I think, again, is why Henri stands out, because he's not only on the margin, like the literal edge of the fucking beach, he doesn't even exit the same way as everybody else. Mm -mm. Like, you never see him go to the car park. He goes the opposite end of the beach and disappears. We don't know where he goes. 
And I love that in so many ways, Henri is the person who is he's the social taboo breaker. And that's why he ends up getting called out and why he's a threat to Michelle. Well, yeah, yeah. He also like directly tells Michelle like, hey, so you're going to kill him next? <laughs> well, there is that <laughs> moment, but that's very late in the game. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, because like, because Michelle's jealous of Henri and the relationship mm-hmm. he has with Frank. Yeah, which I oh I love the That's, interplay between those three. Well, that, okay, I think Michelle is such a pathetic character. <laughs> oh yeah, no he he postures like he is the sexiest man on this beach because he can just fuck anything he wants. But the reality is, is that he is so emotionally closed off. Like you can tell, in some ways, he believes the same kind of thing as Henri. Where I think he's one of those guys who's like, oh, I wouldn't even kiss you. Like I'm just here to fuck. Well, that, that's that's what Henri tells him, you know, he's like, you know, you just like, you know, throw him off until when you're tired with him, move on to the next guy. So even though what, what Michelle is doing is, yeah, when he's done with someone, he kills them and then he moves on to the next guy. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of metaphor allegory for what a lot of gay men who are emotionally closed off because a lot of gay men, maybe I'm generalizing now, too. Sure. But a lot of gay men are emotionally closed off because of the trauma they've experienced as teenagers, mm-hmm. as young adults. And it leads to men like uh, like Michelle, who may not kill their exes, mm-hmm. but they just cast them aside uh, uh, fleetingly. Yes, emotionally disposable, right? Like, I'm yes. not killing you, but I might as well kill your spirit because I'm done with you and I don't need anything more. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about a little bit of this pursuit. So things really get cooking between Franck and Michelle when Franck sees him in the water and he deliberately swims into his path. And then we get this almost meet cute in the water where they each wave at each other. Yeah, it's cute. So (laughs) things would seem to be going well when Michelle ends up coming in sitting beside Franck on the beach, but they're almost immediately interrupted by Ramir, who is played by Francois Renaud Labarthe, and he, should be noted, is also the art director and costume designer for this film. Oh, I did not know that. But I guess, okay, I guess... In my mind, it wasn't just, oh, he got tired of this guy. It's that Mm -hmm. a new guy, Franck, came in his path and he was like, oh, cool. So basically what we could be led to believe is the next time some new shiny twink twunk thing comes along, Mm -hmm. that's when Franck's going to get cast aside. A hundred percent. Yeah. Like at a later point, Michelle will say, oh, well, the reason I don't want to sleep over or go for dinner with you is because we would just get tired of each other in a week. So... (laughs) By that sort of generalization, you can assume that Michelle has almost a time frame with which he will entertain these men, he will dangle, he will fuck them, and then, yeah, either somebody new comes along, or the expiration date has arrived, and now I'm predictably murdering you. I feel like there's more conversation and shaming in the queer community around what types of relationships you have. Like, I've met so many gay guys who were like, oh, God, when you get domestic, you know, when you're mm-hmm. when you when you, you domesticate your relationship. Oh, God, that could never do that. that that's what Michelle would think. But then mm-hmm. there's other people that are like, oh, open relationships. Everyone's open relationships. It's horrible. How could you do that? How could you? You don't love your spouse. It's like, well, no, that's not how that <laughs> works either. It's it, it really amazes me the number of specifically gay men that I see who are closed off to the ideas of certain types of relationships when it's like i feel like as a community we should be more open to these things but oh no we we love to police ourselves and our behavior i would say it's probably second only in judgment within popular culture to talking to other people about how they parent their child oh god yeah Or it's like, you are not allowed to have opinions about what other people are doing. Like, obviously you do, but it's also kind of none of your fucking business. If it's working for other people, keep your fucking mouth shut. Dude. And for the love of God, do not ever compare your pets to someone else's child because they will tell you (laughs) not to do that. (laughs) True. True. Yes. And also do not compare your open relationship to someone's monogamous relationship because they will probably also have very strong feelings. Oh, God, I know, right? (laughs) So, Franck is still in pursuit of Michelle, but now that Ramir has basically cock-blocked him, he goes back to Henri and he complains. He's very upset. I love that he says the guys he likes are always unavailable. And he's saying this to a person who is literally not engaged with any other character in this movie. And it's just like, Frank, sweetie baby angel, not only are we going to come to realize that you're literally chasing death 
to pursue some good dicking, but also you need to learn how to read a room. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, Omri ends up leaving after a moment of silence. He's not he's not upset, but it's kind of like, okay, the conversation is over and the daylight is fading. So he leaves. And this is where Frank ends up hooking up with what I'm going to call man in the Batman shirt or just Batman. I oh, see. Mine was the guy, the, the condom guy <laughs> or the condom guy. Yeah. And he's played by Gilbert Trena. Yeah. So they they go. This is where they clear out the cache of used condoms in the woods they get down to business they're interrupted by eric and yes we have this discussion about the condoms and i love that frank just says oh well i trust you so it's not an issue and in the deleted scene it goes on for quite a bit yeah. longer where man in the batman shirt or batman or condom, condom guy <laughs> you know talks a little bit more about his his thoughts on this but i just think it's so fascinating that Yes, the men on this beach are here for maybe no strings attached sex. Mm -hmm. But for Frank to say, I like you and we're about to get down means that I trust you. It's very telling about his future behavior with Michelle, where you're just like, yeah, you have no reason to trust this person. I think honestly, for me, though, I'm just happy to see this conversation happen. And I actually would have mm -hmm. liked for this deleted scene to be included in the film. Agreed. I can understand why I think they cut it for pacing and because it is just a little too after school special in a way like it's a, yeah, it's a but... bit preachy. But I think it's the same kind of preachy that the film is overall trying to to have well i saw too the original cut of this film was two hours and 18 minutes so while Ooh, we get okay. four minutes of deleted scenes on this blu-ray there were clearly a lot more deleted scenes that they didn't include but um mm -hmm. yeah it's just i mean again like i come from texas the sex education system in texas is poo poo Ooh. uh <laughs> Yes. So I, I, I like seeing a conversation like this in a movie, even though it doesn't really come to an answer, like no one is proven like right or wrong, but it's like they're having the conversation which mm -hmm. needs to be done. Yes, absolutely. Like the, this film could actually be used as a bit of a primer for like, let's have a bunch of conversations about most specifically <laughs> gay men. All right. High schools across America, start screening this to all your students. <laughs> Honestly, let's <laughs> let's have some sex edge conversations about like how do penises work? <laughs> well, because that's the other thing when you talk about the timeline. I don't remember exactly what condom guy says, but because he, he, you know when uh, Frank says that the 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 odds of transmission are very very low, and he's mm -hmm. like, yeah, sure. And if I get it, like I could. Ha he says something about what the treatment is, and I can't remember yes. what he says, but that makes it feel more modern to me than like even the nineties. Uh, there, there were cocktails that you could help at that point. Like, I've never really understood if the cocktails were to help people who were infected with HIV or even AIDS to mm -hmm. just live longer. Like, it helped them. Right. It helped them by boosting their, their immune system, or if it was also about reducing the risk of transmission, you know, when used with safe sex practices. Yeah, I mean, we don't say PrEP here, so I don't know. Uh, No, definitely not. <laughs> I thought you meant in Austin or Texas. And I was like, oh, Christ, you oh, guys no. don't even say prep there. But no, yeah, no, now I'm I get sorry. you mean in the film. <laughs> yes. Oh, but I mean, I don't think schools are saying prep. Of course not. <laughs> no. I mean, I'm presuming there's a lot of. Oh, oh, I was just about to make such a mean. Not even like a joke. It was just a jab at the U.S. Oh, my God. What, what was it? You, you kind of it was like, it aren't back. you guys still teaching that babies are delivered by storks down there? <laughs> Oh, oh, pfft, oh, my God. You need to get meaner, <laughs> which is not something I normally say to you. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I didn't have a sex ed class. I had a semester of health in middle school and mm -hmm. we watched like the video and that was about it. Yes, I had the gym class that got taken up for like two days where we talked about like women have uteruses and men have penises. And <laughs> then in high school, you had to take a compulsory course that was like, life skills overall and they taught you why you shouldn't do drugs how to put a condom on a banana and nothing about like taxes or retirement or anything useful oh yeah no we didn't get any uh, if, my life for a taxes class right? <laughs> how to avoid getting audited <laughs> my but I, I never even got the condom of the banana class like i see that in movies and i'm like who where are we doing this oh, <laughs> not <really>? in texas <laughs> Well, I mean, sir, you just explained why. <laughs> Everything's dumber in Texas. Uh. 
<laughs> okay, so as the light fades, uh, after Frank and Batman slash Condom Guy have uh, hooked up, uh, a mutual. Like, I'm sorry, but they, they hook up via mutual masturbation because that's the only thing they can do without a condom. Yes, and this is where we see the ejaculation. Oh yeah, like full on ejaculation. Uh, mm-hmm. I was. I, hey, I'm sorry. This is like totally like weird, but like I was surprised that Michelle was uh, circumcised. Oh, I, I'll confess I was not looking that closely. <laughs> really? Oh my god! Because because well, it's France, which assume everyone's uncircumcised. So to have one French guy be circumcised, I was like, huh, that's interesting. Hmm. I was about to make a dick cheese joke, and then I was like, no. Oh, God. Th- th- those two words never need to be put in the same like sentence, much less right next to each other. Well, I was going to say because it's France and they love their cheese, but <clears throat> uh, moving on. <laughs> moving on. From that us. is offensive. <laughs> offensive. Okay, so as the light fades, this is how you know that things are starting to get a little dangerous. Uh, yeah. Frank is drawn to the water because he hears sounds. And Trace, I want to know, how well did the sound design fool you on a first time watch? Because the first time I saw this, I was like, oh, they're fucking in the water. Oh, somebody's getting murdered. Well, okay, it starts playfully, though. I feel mm-hmm. like we don't enter this like right into the murder. Like they're no. kind of like playing like playful banter in the it's water. Like, oh, splashing, yeah. splashing. Mm-hmm. It's sexy splashing <laughs> and then murder. <laughs> yeah, well, because he just goes, stop. Or he goes like, don't stop that. Or he says something that's like, oh, yeah, that took a turn. <laughs> yeah, it's affect. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he watched this. Uh, he watches Michelle drown this fucker, and um, yeah, I mean he's dead. Yeah. So there isn't this talk on the Blu-ray, but you can watch the director Alain Giraudy. You can watch him break it down as you watch the scene. So it's an uninterrupted four-minute take. And what they had to do was they swapped out the actor who plays Ramir and they got a man who can hold his breath for up to like, I think they said like eight to 12 minutes. Mm. So when they force him down, like when Michelle forces him under the water, that's this guy. He holds his breath and then he swims like perpendicular to the camera so that he's out of frame frame. and that's why we slightly tilt the camera down so that we're following michelle as he swims in it's basically so that this other guy could get out of frame in the allotted time but it's uninterrupted this dude was a professional but i love the sequence like for most people this is the quote-unquote money shot of the film Mm -hmm. because you look at it and you're like how did they do this? Well, it's also, I mean, again, there's something just creepy about watching this. I and mean, this is when, like, you know, the, the we as the spectator, we're the voyeurs watching this happen. Mm-hmm. And we spend so much of the movie watching, not lewd, but just act, sexual acts, that it's almost, like, not off-putting, but it's shocking when it's like, oh, there's a moment of violence happening that we're getting to see. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to bring in Brody because he has a comment just on that very topic. So he says, the sequence offers an extraordinary contrast of scale, putting the close-up of Frank's ejaculation at the same level as that of the entire lake and the killing that takes place. So basically, we're very much saying sex and then violence. So it pairs pleasure and violence, sex and death, as if the events in the lake were the natural consequence of the volcanic thrust that preceded it. Oof. He's got a way with words. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's very a very eloquent way of saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but I do also love that because this doesn't end. Like that's not where the shot ends. Oh we no! Actually get to watch Michelle come out of the water. He puts his shoes on. He sits there for I want to say thirty seconds while he just kind of stares at what he's done. And then he puts his clothes on and he gets up and walks into the woods, presumably to go to the car park. And it's fascinating because we're left to interpret the psychology of what he's thinking. You know, is he satisfied? Is he sexually satisfied? Like, we often talk about murders as sexual situations, right? Mm. Like, people are being penetrated when they're being stabbed by knives and so on. Is this what Michelle does to truly get off? Well, okay, and that's because I feel like, again, people watch this and be like, well, why does he do this? Why does he do this to mm-hmm. any character in this movie? And sure. what is interesting is on that one interview with the director, he's like, I am not interested in the psychology of my characters. I hate it when movies <laughs> do psychology. It's just characters <laughs> act the way they act. Sure. And I was like, that's 
Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think I think as the director, he's allowed to do that because he implicitly knows what the characters are doing and he just he leaves it open for people to infer and then it's our job as the audience to look at it and say, "Okay, what do we think is happening here?" Well, because again, if we're going for that natural realism that the movie is giving mm-hmm. us, like again, a a movie, a normal quote-unquote movie would be like, "Yeah, but they're going to explain this to you, but right. real life doesn't work that way." If you no. are merely a spectator watching things happen, you don't get to go talk to these people and figure out why they did what they did. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And I feel like this is the part of the film where people are going to not have questions, but they are going to want more answers than the film is ever prepared to give you. And mm-hmm. mostly, it's not even about Michelle. It's about Frank because Frank is standing here watching this all unfold and then he waits until it gets darker and then he goes and i love the shot of him getting in his car and pulling out and we get to see this red car illuminated in his headlights as he drives off and you're like yeah there's one car left in the car park because dude's fucking dead (laughs) but then the next shot trace is when he comes back the next day yeah and it's very clear he did not go to the police and he did not tell anyone what he saw. Well, okay, because he had told Henri earlier that day, he's like, oh, I'm probably not going to come back tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And then he witnesses his murder and just comes back. <laughs> it does. So I'm going to bring Brody back. So Frank keeps quiet about the murder. He maintains his privacy in extremis, keeps his greatest subjective experiences for himself, and thereby brings disaster upon the community as surely and swiftly as if he himself were an accomplice to a killer, as if Frank himself had unleashed that killer in the very form of his own desire. The very incommunicability of Frank's desire is deadly. Silence equals death. And it's true, right? We will kill at least two more characters because Frank refuses to say anything. Dude, he is so frustrating. (laughs) He's so cute, but he's so frustrating. (laughs) That's what I love about this movie. Because like you said, we want him to confide in someone. Like he's got this budding relationship with Henri where it seems like they can be very open and candid. And he doesn't say that. Like Henri figures it out. Okay, but but, but why do you why do you think that? Why do you think he holds on to this? Is it because he's afraid that if he tells someone that he's going to miss out on his chance to be with Michelle? I think it's that I think he's also he's not quite sure what he's actually seen. But you know, he'll say later that he thinks he's falling in love with Michelle. He doesn't want to give it up. He wants to ride it out. And it's interesting because in the interview with Empire de la Donchamp, so the actor playing Franck, he says, Franck wants to spice up his life. He wants to be in this very special relationship because no one else could say, I know that he could kill me, but I love him, and I'm having a good time with him. Franck wants to show Michelle that he is not afraid to die. See, and I, I, I was going another way where I was like, well, maybe it's just hubris. He's like, oh, he's going to kill everyone else because he likes me. He loves mm-hmm. me. He'll never kill me. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's maybe all that. I think it's entirely possible that it's something like that because he keeps after Michelle for the rest of the film. As their relationship sort of builds in intensity and sustains, right? Like, because it goes on for several days, he keeps pestering at him. Why don't we get drinks? Why don't you stay over? Why don't you want to be my boyfriend? Okay, that, but that's also, I, I said Michelle was pathetic, but also like Frog gets <laughs> pathetic too. Because I mean, cause Kinda. honestly, cause, uh, here's the thing. I've been, I've never You've had- been both, haven't you? Well, I, I've never been in this relationship where like someone's like, I don't want to bring you over. Like I've never had, but mm. I've had people that keep me at arm's length, but it was, it was very much in high school. Right. Maybe even a little bit of college, but like in high school, it was more so because like, you know, not everyone was out. Like, you know, you're trying to maintain your, your, your closet status. Sure. But, mm-hmm. but still at the same time, it's like, oh, but that's still fucks you up if you're if you're dating someone who's like that and Mm -hmm. you know people need to come out when they need to come out like on their own times blah 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 but (laughs) it's still like it's frustrating (laughs) oh it's super frustrating yeah i mean i i've never been a michelle i've been a frog (laughs) numerous times like when i was first dipping my toe back into dating after you know licking my wounds and lamenting how i wasn't with my ex who had cheated on me for six consecutive years I started to go out on dates with guys that I knew had no future to it. Like, it was either going to be just sex, or it was like, they didn't even want to have sex with me. They barely (laughs) wanted to see me. And I was so desperate to force some 
some kind of semblance of normalcy on that because I wanted to feel like I was getting better and that I was winning. So it was hubris, but it was also just like, I wanted the social capital of having somebody where I could say, I'm going on a date with this guy and then I'm going to stay over at his place. Oh, yeah, that was that was me in high school and college. One hundred percent serial monogamous. Like Someone breaks up with me, move into the next relationship, blah, 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 blah. Right. Yeah. I've already got the U-Haul packed. I might as well just move in. Basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know. Like, when it, like, before I started dating my husband, like the last relationship, which was a long term one, I was like, OK, I got to I got to be alone for at least like six months <laughs> mm-hmm. and like learn to be alone. Well, and even just know who you are, know what you like. Mm-hmm. What are you actually looking for? It can sometimes just be, yeah, like, I want to get laid, I want to fuck around. But more often than not, when you start to realize you're looking for something else, you have to know, what am I looking for? Like, it can't just be the first guy that walks by. Yeah, no, not at all. But although I do, I do. <laughs> once you have that, that, that self realization, like, you know, that clarity about, like, you know, what you're looking for, what you want in life, when you go on that date, and you know, within five minutes, ugh, no, mm. <laughs> and you gotta suffer through the whole fucking date. <laughs> oh, my God. I had this one date where I met this guy and the mistake was not going for coffee. We went for breakfast or lunch or something. And I ended up getting trapped where this guy wouldn't say a fucking thing. And I was so uncomfortable. I just kept filling the silence with conversation about the most inane bullshit. And then at the end of the date, he literally tells me, this was fun. We should do it again. And then he shot daggers at me when I said, you know what? I just don't think we're a good match. It didn't seem like we had that much in common or we weren't talking very much. And he was like, well, thanks for wasting my fucking time. I'm like, okay. Oh, yeah, that's frustrating. I mean, well, you should have fucking said something, asshole. (laughs) Honestly, uh, I think conversation is a two-way game. It helps when the other person reciprocates. Uh, But some people, and I'm not even excusing this fucker, but like some people are just so fucking shy that they don't Mm -hmm. have those same kind of social cues. They're just like, or or they're like, oh, if they can talk the whole time and that's me being like, like. I'm listening. You're talking. Yeah. yeah. Did I give this guy a moment, like a breather to maybe get something in? Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> He's probably like, I let you, I listen to all your fucking shit for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Motherfucker wouldn't shut up. <laughs> God. Okay. So Frank is back for another day at the beach. We do get shots of both the red car as well as this pile of clothes. It's so sad and tragic and i love that we keep going back to both of these items but we don't feel the need to hammer at home like that's the dead guy's stuff he's he's not been found oh my god people don't care it's like it's all just there you know no. what it means because well, we don't even get like a slow zoom in that an, a, another movie would do or get you know, a, a real movie a movie movie where it's like slowly <laughs> like, the car drives away slow zoom into these clothes mm-hmm. uh-oh it's ominous who's uh oh mm-hmm no, the the film treats its audience with much more respect than that. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Franck ends up crossing the beach to go and sit next to Henri. I love all of these kinds of shots too, because we're always presented with almost POV shots of yeah. the men on the beach. And most of them aren't characters. They don't have names. If you look them up on Wikipedia, it's just like, you know, nude man on beach or whatever. But there's so much watching like if we are frank in these point of view shots we're being judged and appreciated and leered at by these other men in the same way that we ourselves are doing the same to them well i was gonna say because because like, we're basically now cruising with frank except we're yes. cruising right now for a murderer we're not cruising mm-hmm. for like just random dick true yes well we we could be doing both well, I'm mean, sorry, we're, we're like surveying the people. Okay, where is he? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where is he? Is he already <laughs> here? Where is he? <laughs> where is that mustache? Uh, tellingly enough, it, it's amusing to me that we've gone like over an hour into this episode and we've not mentioned the other most comparable film to this, which of course is William Friedkin's Cruising. Oh. And I would say that this to me feels much more in tune with the gay community. Sure. I mean, it helps when you have a gay writer and director. Truly, yeah. And I think this is also the advantage of making a movie 30 some odd years after the fact. But I think it's just it's interesting when you put the two films in conversation to each other. This one is just 
so much less salacious and titillating in the yeah. way that it presents queer life. But I think, again, going back to what you were saying earlier, it's very much the European sensibility because I cannot see this movie ever getting made in America. Oh, and, God, no. and, and not even remade. This movie no. wouldn't even get remade in America. And if it did, it would it would have murders every 15 minutes. I mean, look, I'd still watch that movie. Sure. <laughs> you know what? I would love to see someone try. And if folks are again screaming at us and saying oh you're overlooking this movie you should watch it by all means reach out yeah let us know I, I'm, I'm dying to know <laughs> okay so when franck sits with Henri, this is when they have more of a conversation about how franck thinks that Henri he has a reputation for being weird because yep. he doesn't talk to anybody and he sits off by himself and i love that we're having this conversation but we're also not having a conversation about certain things like I just think it's so important that Henri is older, that he's fat, mm -hmm. um, that he admits that he is not into cruising, he's not into sex. And all of these things immediately move him out of this perfect fantasy microcosm of hot, fit, sexually driven young men who are populating this beach. Mm hmm. I mean, it's not exclusive. We do see older men who are in the foliage when Franck is moving around, but like they're not characters. So Henri is really the only verbal representation of that. That's actually kind of what I found fascinating, though, is that the fatter, older, less conventionally attractive men are mm -hmm. usually the ones we see fucking in the thickets. Right? And, yeah. not, and not on the shore. Uh huh. Uh huh. And then we've got like Philip and his friend, and then we've got Eric the voyeur and his what will eventually be revealed to be his husband, who's like very mouthy and opinionated. God, and jealous. We don't see those men in those situations, except for Eric, who is a fixture of comedy and a bit of mockery. Yeah. Uh huh. Absolutely. But hey, you know what? He gets his at the end. He does indeed. Yeah. You know what? Persistence. <laughs> <laughs> terrible it makes me so uncomfortable i hate those scenes it no it's very sad like it's it's not sexual assault but like franck is just like okay dude like whatever <laughs> just blow <Yeah>. me <laughs> like oh i just had a fight with my boyfriend and he's left so i guess i could fuck you but i don't really want to i think that the capper for me is when eric finishes blowing him and it's so evident that franck has basically just used him and he's not even gonna think twice about him no and Eric gets up and then shakes his hand. Oh, God. I oh, my God. Died. Another handshake after Bound last week, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it, I mean, that's a sexy handshake. This is a sad handshake. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's very sad. Like nothing about this is happy. <laughs> Interestingly enough, we, we get a better sense of what Franck is interested in here. Like he will leave Henri at a moment's notice like the drop of a hat oh, if he yeah. sees Michelle show up he will leave him but he also does want to foster a more fulsome relationship with Henri because he does ask him if he wants to go for drinks it's evident at one point that they had a dinner we don't get to see it but they talk about it the day after uh okay so yeah that's like the end of this day effectively it's a pretty short one and then we're back car park shoes and towel all the same old same old we're in the we're in the rhythm like we're in the movie's rhythm exactly yeah so same day different day it's all kind of the same yeah. but uh, michelle does eventually emerge from the water to sit with him and this is really the beginning of their relationship so bear in mind this is the first time that they have spoken to each other since Frank has watched him murder someone. And one of the first things Michelle asks him is, where's your boyfriend? Retur mm -hmm. Referring to Henri. And at first I thought he was joking. Like, oh, is he just making... But he actually thought he was his boyfriend. Yes. Yeah. Which is an interesting thing, right? Like, there's a bunch of people who are showing up to this beach with either a significant other or in the case of Philip, we don't know who the other man he's with is, but... I think the default assumption is that if you're here by yourself, then you're looking to hook up. But if you're here with somebody else, then maybe you're just taking in the view. So Michelle is trying to get a read on the availability of Frank. But also, if you look at it, oh, well, he's a murderer. He's looking to see who is going to be noticed if you go missing. Because yep. if you've got a boyfriend, someone's going to ask a question. But, but but I also love Frank's response to him is, oh, well, what did you do with your boyfriend? <laughs> <laughs> like, not, not where is he? What did you do with him? <laughs> yeah. And it's not cheekily delivered, but it's very much a, 
like when you've seen the film and you kind of know, it's a little bit of, I know what you did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, this is where they have a kiss. Then Michelle gives him head. And then Franck finishes him off at dusk. And one thing that we haven't noticed, in the same way that Henri always disappears in one particular direction, like it's a Mm. recurring thing throughout the film... I noticed on this rewatch that Frank always wants to be kissed if he's going to come. And to me, yeah. that signals the level of intimacy that he's looking for. Yeah, which, you know what? Good for him. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, let's be honest, Trace, for a certain portion of, again, specifically the gay male community, there are a lot of people who feel like the level of intimacy is at its peak with kissing. Like, I will fuck you, but I will not kiss you because that is too intimate. Well, okay, so I, I have 100% been with... Well, I'm sorry. I have talked to guys who were like, no kissing. And that's mm-hmm. my like, nope, I'm out. Sorry. Don't, no. <laughs> Absolutely. Kissing's too much fun. I don't... Well, I just don't understand how you can be intimate. Like, it's not even because I'm like, oh, kissing is this intimate thing that I need. It's more so just like, it's just, it's just a natural reaction. But mm-hmm. normally, and maybe I'm assuming some things here, but the guys that are very much like that, yes, it's part of like, oh, they don't want to get too intimate. Or... It's the, oh, kissing means I'm actually gay. Like, right. they're still kind of closeted. Um, mm-hmm. But the pretty woman rules are so weird. I don't, I don't understand that with men. Like, just fucking kiss. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. To me, it does feel distinctly different from, like, oh, I don't, like, I don't give head or I don't eat ass or something like that. Like, uh, some people I, just have things that they, they either don't enjoy or they don't enjoy doing to other people. But kissing just, that to me is the one where I'm like, I don't get it. Yeah. Like, what are you yeah. hiding? I mean, the, the, yeah, because I, I, I've never, well, I don't think I've ever had someone say no about blowjobs, but I've definitely had people say no rimming or I only give rimming or I only right. get rimming. And mm-hmm. while I understand it, I'm always kind of like, eh, I'm losing interest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, kissing and rim, honestly, I would give up blowjobs and just if, if it was kissing, blowjobs, rim jobs, I would give mm-hmm. up blowjobs. Oh, okay. Rim jobs are the best. <laughs> just shower first <laughs> yes uh psa that is that is good advice <laughs> i just love how like staunchly like your political platform is rimming is actually good everybody get to it. rimming is better than blowjobs <laughs> um, you know what i'm gonna disagree but that's okay that's we can fine. all like different things some of us have very sensitive assholes oh my god okay sure <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing. You may sit at the back of the class now. I'm not even drinking for this recording. <laughs> I'm stone cold sober. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, okay, so Michelle does not come in this moment. Frank offers to help him out, and he's kind of like, no, I'm good, whatever. I was surprised by this, by the way. Agreed. Yeah, I definitely thought that this was going to be, okay, we're just going for it. But I do think it's kind of fascinating that this is technically their first verbal interaction apart from when like, you know, that brief piece where we yeah. interrupted them. But we go introductions, confirmation that you're available, not fucking, but like, you know, second base, whatever. Sure. And then as he's leaving, like as he's taking note of Frank's car, because guess what, everybody? He's also clocking. Oh, hey, you were here when I committed murder. Because I saw your car in the parking lot. <laughs> this is finally the moment where we learn Michelle's name. Oh my god, it takes this long? Mm-hmm. Oh shit, I did not even note that. Yeah, it's a while. Like, we don't learn characters' names for so, so long in this movie. But this is the longest one. It's probably because I had the Wikipedia up, so like, in my yeah. notes, I needed his name, so I didn't even like. 100%. About that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but if you're just watching this and you're trying to pick up names, you're like, hot mustache guy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that is the end of that day. We come back, more parking lot, more saying hello to Philippe. I will note when when Franck shows up, this is when we're introduced to Eric's husband. He does not have a character name, but he is played by Sebastien Baracau. And he's the one who complains that the beach is not a cruising spot, only the woods are. And he specifically says local queers would screw the planet if you could, suggesting that he and Eric are actually vacationing queers. So I think this is again a bit of a oh, the middle class versus the peasants and the queer ghetto. So this is city gays infiltrating the 
Provence Lake and being like, mm, there's rules. You need to follow them. Ba, 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 ba. I am so interested in this place because honestly, th- this guy's an asshole. I'm kind of like, dude, dude like, so, but, but at the same time, I'm kind of like, God damn it though. But he's kind of justified because his husband's here fucking cruising, trying to jack off to everybody. Well, to me, this is more of an inferiority complex. Like he's projecting shit about how his husband is out trying to fuck anything that moves. And he's like, mm, well, maybe people shouldn't be cruising here. Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, dude. Maybe you need to talk to your your husband. Well, that, about that's what's the going thing. On. Like I, 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 it, it, these people that are just cheating and cheating, I'm just just open up. It's gonna say if you don't want to open up, it's fine. But then you got to break up. Like open up or break up. Honestly, everybody's gonna be happier in the long run because you need to get your issues on the table. My God, there was some movie with straight people where like they were all fucking each other, and I was like, if like all these people, oh oh, it was the White Lotus with the Avi <laughs> Plaza character, and I was right, like, yeah. all these people just fucking each other, and they're like, oh my God, they're cheating. I'm gonna go cheat on them. I was like, if y'all mm-hmm. just, like, just open up your marriages, it's because fu- they're gonna they're staying together this miserable life. I mean, just open up, and this is gone. <laughs> I love it. Written by a queer man in Mike White as well, yeah. so you you know that he's saying, look at these stupid fucking straight people. They're all so fucking hot. They could be having four Gs and. And instead, they're just staying in these shit relationships. Yeah, thinking that they're cheating on each other secretly, but not secretly mm-hmm. because they all know and they're still doing it. And I, yeah. I, I was, again, I love that second season, but I was oh, yeah. so perplexed. I was like, why don't like, you all know you're doing it? Just mm-hmm. open up. <laughs> oh, no, but that's where all the drama comes from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a one episode season of White Lotus. Oh, I cheated on you. Cool. I also cheated on you. Should we stick together? Nah, let's break up. Oh, End no, no. It's like, do, do we want to, like, be, like, a thruple or a quadruple with them? Sure, mm-hmm. let's do it. <laughs> right. Oh, so progressive. <laughs> Breaks HBO's uh, standards and practices. Yeah. A quapple. A quapple. A quapple? <laughs> no, I don't like it. We'll workshop like, that. I don't like that. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so interestingly enough, when Franck approaches Henri for their daily chat, Henri says that Eric's husband pulled the exact same shit on him the previous week asking him not to stare again this can only be comedy given how eric is portrayed throughout the entire film like he's a character who just walks around jacking off looking at other people i feel kind of bad because i wonder if part of it too is that the comedy is meant to be from eric's appearance um oh i think so too because he is quote unquote not as conventionally attractive whereas his husband which i don't even remember what he looks like but i remember his husband being more conventionally attractive than eric think so yeah he's he's only in this one scene so it is hard to tell Mm -hmm. (laughs) this is definitely when we're getting more insight into Henri's state of mind so we start with yeah like that guy's an asshole and then Frank goes you you seem a little on edge or you're a little bit you know is everything going okay and this is where Henri says he's anxious to get back to work because it occupies his mind like he's not used to having so much free time and I think this is where you can really start to read the loneliness and the isolation it's why he likes Frank so much because Frank is the only person who pays any attention to him but but he also never gives him any shit whenever he ditches him at the drop of a di- of a hat for, for for Michelle and I'm like dude <sighs> tell him he's an asshole sometimes <laughs> It's tough, right? Haven't you had that friend where you're thick as thieves, they're the best friend, but then the minute they start dating somebody, you literally cannot pin them down because yep. they're they're off dating, they're off fucking this person, and oh. you're like, I can't get mad at you, but also, you're a shit friend. My husband had a friend who he no longer talks to, but like, it, it was very much that, where it was like, he would get in a relationship and was like, just gone. Like, we never saw him. Mm-hmm. But then as soon as he was out of that relationship, oh, he's back, he needs comforting, blah, blah, yeah. blah, give it three months, he's, he's with us all the time, and then three months later, oh, with someone again, we won't see him for a year. Wow. Yeah. You know what? Good for Ari for, I don't know if that was the reason for the end of the friendship, but that's one of those things where you think, oh, friendships can also be toxic. Or it's like, you're using me. That's yeah, not great. A hundred percent. That was part of many reasons that ended the friendship. <laughs> Ooh, okay. So Michelle arrives shortly after this. And as we just discussed, Frank immediately ditches Henri. It's a shit friend. Yeah. Frank and Michelle go into the woods. They get some 69 action, some mm-hmm. fingering, and finally we get to the unprotected sex. I, this is maybe stupid, but I appreciated that it was versatile and they both took turns. I definitely made a note. We flip-flop. Yay, good for them. Um, mm-hmm. Still not a fan of the spit on the hand. 
No, no. And uh, in case you were wondering, this is most likely where we were starting to use those not just body doubles, but apparently they also tried to go with prosthetics at one point. So in the Empire interview, Giraudy does talk about how they experimented with prosthetics, but that they were deeply unsexy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, because the, the, they wouldn't move. Because here's the thing: there's what it's one thing to have a prosthetic dick when you're just like, okay, like you're just hanging there, you're hanging dong. Yes, but when they need to be in action, mm-hmm. apparently prosthetic penises aren't good for that. Like it's, it wouldn't move like a real one, is what they said. Yeah, I love it. the The quote from Pau is, "It was like a metal screw with a dildo between us, and it didn't move." <laughs> <laughs> it was like a gear stick in a car, more than mm-hmm. a dick. No, no thanks. <laughs> okay, so this is where Frank begins to suggest, hey, we should do something more long term. We should do more outside of just spend time here. And Michelle counters with, you know what, if we did that, we'll be tired of each other within a week. <laughs> and bringing back Brophy, he says, in these terms, the genitals are actually less private than the bedroom, the body less personal than the apartment, and erotic pleasure less intimate than domestic routine. So, It's an interesting way of approaching a queer experience, right? Where somehow fucking someone in the bushes, having like full penetrative anal sex is less intimate than going for a dinner or sleeping over. I've seen some people take qualms with the inspector character that's going to be introduced soon. Mm -hmm. And I think it's partially because he feels vaguely homophobic. But I think that he's also there to act as a bit of a voice of reason where it's like, well, why are certain things more acceptably romantic or intimate when having a dinner at somebody's house? That should not be a deal breaker. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, like, vaguely homophobic is a good way to do it, because I, I I do think he feels out of his element, like, he's perplexed. He's like, wait, 100%. But, <laughs> but I feel like a lot of it, though, comes from just his copness. I don't think he's homophobic. If that makes any sense. Like, I think he's an asshole cop. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in some ways, this is a good comparison for cruising, right? Where it's, okay, I'm interacting with people from a marginalized community that I do not identify with, but I somehow have to make it work. But also, I'm moving into their spaces. I don't understand the culture. I don't understand even, I think, the nuance. And some of the things I'm saying, I'm saying them wrong. Right. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's basically where we're at. When Franck arrives the next day, the beach is completely deserted. There's a helicopter searching overhead. And Henri tells him, hey, a body washed up and nobody's here. And I love that Henri says, I think this is like the death of the season. We're probably not going to see anybody ever again. And (laughs) Franck just goes, "Ah, give it two days. Yeah, which literally, I think it's even a day. (laughs) I think it's a day. It's the next day. Yeah. (laughs) Um, so they initially make plans for dinner, but Franck will end up breaking this so that he can go and have sex with Michelle, but also because they are interrupted by the inspector, Dan Rotter, who is played by Jerome Chapet. Well, this almost feels too like an inversion of the Eric character. So instead of Eric coming by to like masturbate and watch them, it's the cop Mm -hmm. that's like, hello, what are you doing? He he is detective (laughs) cock block for the rest of this film. (laughs) (laughs) so he's asking them about you know okay hey there was this guy ramir we've identified his body and we know that he was killed on tuesday so can you tell us where you were who you were with and so on and both men lie so frank says he didn't know him and that also he spent tuesday evening with that man slash condom guy and michelle also lies but he says he was not in the water and then the inspector leaves and they're both like so I know that you lied. Why did you lie? <laughs> yeah, um, I love the simplicity of this too, because it, it's not like a big thing. It's like, oh, Frank says I was here um, with that guy until after dark, which we know is a lie. It's like, well, that's mm-hmm. probably going to come back and bite you in the ass. I think yep. the thing is that we expect Michelle to be a little bit better at lying, and he's also not very good at lying. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. One of the other interesting things that I've often pondered about this movie is whether this was Michelle's first murder. Mm. And we have no idea. It can only be speculation because the character, I mean, we we don't get to know him in any great detail because we're really siding with Frank for most of the time. Right. 
But also, Franck doesn't talk to him about that because he doesn't want to interfere with their sexual relationship. So we don't get any more insight from Michelle about the murder. And see, okay, but I relate with Franck on that so much. Not the whole, like, murderer thing, but, like, the thing where it's, like, he doesn't want to bring it up because he's afraid of ruining what they have right now. Which is, again, such a temporary thing. Like, you can only keep up this charade for so long. Mm -hmm. Charade, if we're talking in French. (laughs) Fuck off. (laughs) Um, but no, I, I definitely been in a relationship where I'm like, oh, like this thing really annoys me about this person, but I don't want to bring it up because it's kind of a deal breaker, but I like what mm-hmm. we're doing right now. So I'm just going to hold on to it. But then that grows and festers into resentment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not good. <laughs> but at the same time, I mean, if you're insecure about the status of your relationship as Frank clearly is with oh Michelle, yeah right like it's not just oh we're in the honeymoon period right now it's, it's literally i cannot get this guy to do anything with me except fuck me in the woods only in the woods <laughs> only in the woods <laughs> and maybe the beach later yeah <laughs> I guess the other thing that I find so telling, which is just, I mean, obviously murdering a man is a red flag, but then saying, I won't miss him. I'm just like, Michelle, buddy, therapy. I I guess the thing is this, though, because Michelle, I I presume, doesn't know that Franck knows yet. Oh, see, I think he does, because that's why he (sighs) clocks his car when they left the other day. Uh, remember he makes a big deal about saying oh this is a rare car hmm tell me all about it because he knows that Frank was there yeah i guess that makes sense i guess in my mind i was just like well if he doesn't know that he knows then yeah he's trying to like wave it off like ah, it's gonna be fine i didn't miss him but then mm-hmm. i guess i mean he's a killer anyway so what the fuck does he care yeah see i think he's a shrewd killer and part of keeping this on is to find out how much Frank knows and maybe get some sex out of it but also I think that Michelle has always planned to kill Frank. Like, the minute that he knew that he was there, I think it's like there's an expiration date on the relationship and also your life. Okay, put it. we can talk about that when we get to the end of the movie then. Yes, okay. <laughs> All right, so, parking lot, new day. <laughs> <laughs> I can only say it so many times. I know. Frank arrives, he kisses Michelle because Michelle is actually already there. And then he ditches Michelle and goes to visit with Henri. Mm. And they don't get to do much talking because Inspector Damrotter interrupts them. So he makes an interesting comment that he thinks they all know each other or they should all know each other because they (laughs) frequent this beach so often. And I was just like, ooh, tell me that you are not a member of the queer community. (laughs) Yeah, like... (laughs) I've seen people fucking in bathrooms. Come on. Right. Public bathrooms. <laughs> well, and then and then he pulls Franck aside so that he can question him more because he doesn't believe that Franck was with someone that he doesn't know his name or his phone number. And this would be Batman Condom Guy. And you're just like, well, yeah, what? You've never had anonymous sex before. It's like okay. he is lying to you, but he really doesn't know this guy's name. <laughs> it's true. It's 100% true. <laughs> So this leads Franck to ask some questions of his own. So post-coital in the woods, he begins to ask Michelle more about Ramir. Like, don't you miss him? What did you know about him? Aren't you a little bit worried that maybe this guy (laughs) who killed him is out there? And this is when Michelle just goes, oh, are you interrogating me now? And it's like, (laughs) yeah, but it's it's such a douchey way to brush this off, right? Because he's making him feel guilty about it. 100%. Yeah, it's not just, oh, I don't want to talk about it right now. It's he fully gaslights him by flipping the tables on him. Yes. And then tellingly, he says, because by this point, it's pretty late in the day. Let's go for a swim. (laughs) Let's go for a swim because we're here all by ourselves. And I love that there's this moment where Frank says no, he's not going to do it. And he's sitting on the on the beach and he's watching Michelle swim out. And then it's the same thing that he does with Eric, where he just relents. Okay, I wrote wrote my notes. Frank is like, no. And Mm -hmm. then literally my next bullet, dude, what are you doing? He's just out there in the water. (laughs) And I will say, I think that Géraldi's directorial style, like it's very deliberate in its naturalistic approach. Like he's not showy, right? Yeah. But this moment, as Michelle begins swimming towards Franck, I've seen people compare it to Jaws, and I think it's apt. 
Well, that's the thing, right? I mean, it, ah, I feel like some people will watch this and be like, this isn't very scary. It's not very thrilling. It's not very tense. But it's like, this moment is just mm-hmm. like, and maybe it's masked by your frustration with Franck, where you're like, dude, what? you deserve everything that's coming for you. But Judgy. <laughs> very judgy. But at the same time, it, yeah, this is, I was just like, oh my God. But then I was like, well, there's still like 30 minutes left. He's not going to kill him now. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is when you need to be in the theater because you don't know how much time is left. <laughs> true. Yes. Very true. Very true. The other thing I like about this scene is that we then cut to an extreme long shot that just reinforces how far out they are and how isolated. Like, it's just them in this entire body of water. So if Michelle does decide to do something, there is no escape and there's no one to help. Yeah. Mm hmm. But I like, refresh my memory. Do we didn't just cut to them fucking on the shore or is it like a bit before we get there? Uh, no, we basically cut after this. So it's almost like. From Frank's position, the scariness of nearly being murdered is the aphrodisiac, and we can't even wait to get to the woods. We gotta fuck right there on the beach. Yeah, yes. Oh, I like that. I didn't even think about that, but yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time we've seen someone fucking on the beach, I think. It is, indeed. Yeah, it's the only time we'll see it, too. Mm. Oh, no, sorry, it is not. Never mind. <clears throat> <laughs> There's plenty of sex in this movie. Yeah. Okay, so after this, we go to the parking lot, and... Sorry, it's the same day, though, so it's nighttime at the parking lot, Mm. and Michelle is still refusing dinner or sleepover, and he basically claims that he doesn't want to get too attached. So we've shifted from, I think if we spend too much time together, I'll get bored of you, to now he's softening. It's almost like, ooh, Franck's approach is winning him over. He just (laughs) doesn't want to get too attached. And I think this is masterful manipulation. A hundred percent. Oh, God. It's 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 like the um, I guess it's dramatic irony, right? Where you just know. I mean, but the, the thing is, though, it's not dramatic irony because Frank knows all of this shit. Yeah. <laughs> Frank has just as much information as we do. <laughs> he knows, but he's willing to lie to himself because he keeps telling himself that being like living in this nebulous zone in this almost fairy tale timelessness with Michelle where everything is so good he just doesn't want to push it for risk of popping this bubble and you're like i guess but at what cost dude uh his life clearly his life his life <laughs> that is the cost folks <laughs> So we cut to the next day, and almost immediately, Frank is confronted by Batman, a uh, condom, condom guy, guy, because he has found out that Dam Rodder, Inspector Dam Rodder, believes that he was with Frank on the night of the murder. And he's like, Why would you say that? We weren't. We were together in the afternoon, but I wasn't with you. And now I'll, suddenly I'm a fucking suspect. And then later frank goes and sits with henri and he is warned about michelle so henri is fully saying maybe you need to be less trusting of this guy i'm not sure it's great for you and this is where frank is like uh i don't know i'm like falling in love with him i don't know what to do <laughs> fucking idiot i mean again like it, he is so frustrating but at the same time there are parts in where i'm like oh, i kind of get it though man Oh, for sure. Anyone who has ever been infatuated with someone will know exactly what Franck is doing. Any kind of intellect or rational reasoning sense, a uh, sense of self-preservation <laughs> just fucking flies out the window because you're so enraptured by this person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Girl, I've been there. <sighs> We've all been there. I will say one other thing about this conversation with Henri, and it's, I think, one of the reasons I love this character so much is he says his heart races for their friendship and he admits flat out because people could easily misread this in that beat where they say oh no this guy just wants to fuck frank that's what this has all been about but he clarifies immediately it's not sexual like he just loves him as a friend and he is really worried for him but this is like again like this is where it's like uh, uh, Henri's sexuality never really became like oh he's the closeted gay or whatever he's just gay or he's <laughs> fluid or whatever i feel like the reason i like this character so much is because gay friendships are mm. Not also not discussed very often. That's why I mean I, I mentioned Bros earlier. I love Bros. It's a great right. movie, but you know no one wants to go see it. Mm-hmm. But I feel like we we so rarely get to see like introspective movies about queer friendships, right? And I like that. 
despite the fact that Henri is maybe not the body type that Franck would normally go for, I like that mm-hmm. there isn't really a sexual component to this. And e- even if Henri is sexually attracted to uh, Franck and lying about it, I just, I like having this platonic friendship. And not to mm-hmm. say that friends that can't fuck either. I mean, by all means, friends of benefits is great. But <laughs> I, I like that we have this... Uh, Chase isn't the word I want to use for it, but like just this. It's a non sexual friendship. Yeah, yeah, I like it. We don't see that very often, I feel like. Absolutely. And I think some people could feel gently, emotionally manipulated by the decision that Henri is going to make on behalf of Franck, like what mm-hmm. he's willing to sacrifice for his friendship. I feel like it's a natural extension of where the plot is already going. And I think it only hurts as much as it does because so much work has been done into making Henri a standalone character that we genuinely care for. Yeah, absolutely. So amidst all of this conversation, that's when Michelle shows up and I love the repetition. So Michelle says he's he's basically flipping out on Frog and he says, where have you been? I've been waiting. And yeah. it's the exact same line that Ramir used yep. when he was first talking to Frog. It's so beach. pathetic. And mm-hmm. uh, um, see, okay, I was about to say, and he's jealous of Henri, but that makes it sound like Henri isn't isn't worthy of jealousy. He is worthy of jealousy. Mm-hmm. The, the the comedy from this to me comes from Michelle doesn't think that Henri, because of the way he looks, would be worthy of jealousy, which is exactly. which is what's making him more jealous about it. Yes. Yeah. Like Michelle. With his perfect body and yeah. his sex appeal and his ability to get anybody, he keeps finding his, you know, future <laughs> future murder victim and current lover talking with this guy. And it's like, what is going on here? Why do you keep spending time with him? And we will also learn that Michelle has been asking questions of Henri, like basically a, hey, you need to kind of stay away from this guy. He's mine, which is another red flag. It's one of the reasons why Henri says, hey, you maybe shouldn't trust him. Okay, so despite the rudeness and the insecurity of Michelle's comments, this is when Franck leaves Henri, and we get another post-coital scene in the woods, but this time the vibe has changed Mm -hmm. so the relationship is not good it's a little rocky they're both kind of going at each other it's not super catty but it's not the same as it's been normally yeah and uh this is actually where eric shows up and we have to tell him to go away but michelle winds up calling Frank stupid and he just kind of storms off and then this is when eric makes his move on Frank on the beach and we get the super awkward blowjob handshake yeah but yeah i mean we've already said this is just sad (laughs) it's sad you know i I guess good for eric for finally getting what you want i mean he he seems happy with he's he seems satisfied so i mean Mm -hmm. it's sad for us to watch eric but eric doesn't seem embarrassed by this no which i think just doubles down on how cringe it is as an audience member where you're like oh he has no shame but then even saying that out loud it does feel a little bit judgy doesn't it but that's the thing right like i almost admire him like you know what good for you man like i mean i I, if i were in your position i would feel like a piece of shit but Mm -hmm. you clearly don't so yeah more power to you (laughs) more power to you question mark If nothing else, I think the scene exists primarily to reinforce a pattern of behavior in Franck, where he is too easygoing to his detriment. Like, people can easily wear him down. So even when he says no, he said no to Michelle, still got on the leg. He says no to Eric, still got the blowjob. That's okay. And I think I I know I've talked about this before, but I see. And that's I do relate with Franck that way. We're like, I, I, I have put myself or... I have found myself in sexual situations because I don't want to be rude. I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll do it, even though I don't want to. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, we've had this conversation before, but I have also done that. Honestly, I'm willing to bet that nearly every person listening has found themselves in a situation where they probably did something either more than they wanted to or when they didn't really feel like doing it just because it was easier to go along with it. And guess what, folks? That's a slippery slope because that that can lead to some really bad shit. Yeah, you have to learn to deal with conflict. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Don't 
put someone else's feelings above your own, especially like bare minimum, have concern for yourself. Well, no, but it's like, uh, I could do I, do I want to say no and have the guy go off on me like that, like that silent guy went off on you? Or do I just mm-hmm. want to give him a blowjob and get it over with and leave? <laughs> what's gonna take longer <laughs> uh folks the an- the correct answer in this scenario is still a it's still the first one <laughs> conflict is still better don't compromise yourself i got a movie in like an hour oh so. my god just okay fine here we go Zip. <laughs> yep all right so in the dark frank is approached by inspector damrotter and this is where we get the questionably homophobic slash i think just uninformed opinions so he notes that he has been staying late and he's been coming more often than he said initially but also hey um it's been two days why is everybody back here don't you folks know how to treat each other well or love yourselves and it's like yes but also fuck you okay no but but he but he also says you don't care if something happens to one of your own and i'm like Ugh. We don't mm-hmm. always. <laughs> we 100% don't. And I, I think this is also the danger of treating any marginalized group as a monolith. Like, black people do not speak exclusively for all black people in the same way that all gay men do not speak for all queer people. Or sure. even all gay men. Like, it's just, it's so dangerous to say... Well, because you have this one very important thing in common, it means that you should all have like a hive mind about it. Because the reality is, we're all still individual people. So, but but here's the thing, though. He's a cop. And mm-hmm. I feel like cops do have that mentality about other cops. Well, he's profiling too, right? Like he's basically saying, oh, as a queer person, I expect you to behave in this way. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I guess I, I'm playing devil's advocate with the cop here because I'm kind of like, mm-hmm. I mean, it is a little fucked up that they're all still fucking on this oh, beach when there's a bit no, of murder. No, it 100% <laughs> is. It's, it's more, I think it's very specific that this character is the one to say it because right. Henri has been saying a variation of this, but he's been saying it in a far less politically loaded way. Well, he's not trying and to I think solve that's murder. the difference between a member who is maybe a foot in the queer community mm. or has dabbled in it versus somebody who's like oh, I'm just here to solve a crime. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. So the inspector leaves, and this is where Michelle appears. It's like he's fucking lurking, just (laughs) eavesdropping on this conversation. This is the part of the movie where I'm like, oh, this is going to end real badly. I knew it was going to, but this is the confirmation where basically Michelle says, I guess you really do love me because of what... Frank just said and lied to Inspector Dan yeah. Rotter about. And then Frank hugs him. Yep. <laughs> and he's like, oh, you're going to fucking die. Oh, all right. When we get to the alternate endings or the extended ending, I bet you that's mm-hmm. why they cut that part because we have this hug here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's the last day of the film. And we should note that even though it's starting the same. There's a very clear difference in both the audio and the visual because it's a windy day as though telegraphing, oh, a storm is approaching. The winds have shifted. It's the end of the summer. It's the end of your summer of love. Shit's about to get real. Mm -hmm. So despite this, we open on Michelle and Frank holding hands while they're sunbathing nude. And the insinuation is that they left together after Inspector Damrotter's questioning the night before. So you can either read it as they went and they had drinks or they had dinner or he stayed over or something. But it's very cute couple behavior. Yeah. I'm sorry. Cute couple behavior is fine. Not this one. (laughs) (laughs) No, yeah, for sure. It's just not in this particular case. Yeah, not in this scenario. (laughs) So Franco's swimming, and while he's out, this is where Henri comes over and begins talking to Michelle. It's interesting that Michelle reiterates some of the things that Franck had already said to Henri, right? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, hey, how come you never interact with anybody? But again, the tone is so different. This is heavily confrontational. Oh, yeah, no. Okay, so uh, my favorite exchange. So he, he, Henri goes, will you drown him too when you're fed up? Mm -hmm. What makes you say that? Well, you're not very subtle. (laughs) (laughs) The saddest thing is that anyone with two eyes in their head uh, will immediately understand, 
oh, Henri just fucking signed his death warrant by yeah. saying this. And then he stands up and he goes to the edge of the woods and then he turns back. And I love this. I fucking love this because it looks, if you were just watching this from the outside, it would look like he's cruising, right? He is fishing for Michelle. He's inviting him to follow him into the woods. Normally, this would be for sex. And instead, it's murder. So, okay, but th this is the thing, right? Okay, <laughs> he gets killed. Mm -hmm. Funk finds him. Yep. And what Henri says is, I, in his dying breaths, his yeah. throat is bleeding out. Mm -hmm. I got what I wanted. Only thing stopping me, fear of suffering. And I read this as he's been wanting to kill himself for a very long time, but hasn't oh. been able to do it himself. Okay. I can definitely see that. Yeah, because... In this way, it's a two birds with one stone situation. He gets what he wants, which is death, but also he gets to quote unquote save or alert his friend who he has such strong feelings for. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But so, okay, so you're viewing a purely selfless reason for this sacrifice. I look at this as him murdering himself. And sure. I think that there could be an inherently negative read of this where we've already got this outsider character because he is fat. He's not cruising. He's not sexually active. He's maybe not even identifying as a member of the queer community. And he's willing to die for our protagonist. Like it does kind of smack of the straight savior. <laughs> A little bit, right? <laughs> but well, I don't read it that way because of the time and the energy that we've spent working with Henri to make him such a, a memorable character. And I think it's sad, but it also feels like something that happens in horror, right? Like, yeah, we sometimes kill the best friend because we know it's going to hurt. Well, okay, so then what do you make of I got what I wanted? What did he want? I think he he wanted proof that Michelle actually was a killer. Interesting. Yeah, I'm very much going with I wanted to die. <laughs> Fair. I, I think both of those readings can can be proven listeners do you have any other readings of this please like throw it because i honestly but at this point like there really is any reading you can make from this so throw them our way uh it's a sex scene because he wanted an intimate encounter with another man and he got it and see i almost also read it as like, i got what i wanted meaning i got a friend out of you even though like you right. were a terrible friend to me yeah yeah i mean he talked about how lonely he was and how much he valued the effort that frank was putting in to come and sit with him every day yep Oh, God, it's so sweet. <laughs> That's it's the romance so we need. <laughs> Honestly, e e even if it's platonic, platonic love yes. in this movie, mm -hmm. it's the strongest relationship that this film presents. No, it's the thing. I feel more connected to Franck and Henri's characters than I do to Franck and Michelle. Oh, 100%. But I think that's by design. Like, it's not a weakness of the film. No, no, no. no. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. <sighs> so Henri is dead, and... Michelle is right around the reeds. So he starts calling for Franck. Franck bails. He runs through the woods and the light is fading. So it's the end of the day. We're going into dusk and Michelle happens to come across Inspector Damrotter and he just stabs him in the gut. So, oh, oh did you think <laughs> that this other straight savior was going to come in and help? No, he's fucking dead. He's useless. I actually, the way this is shot too is really cool because Frank sees the inspector first and he's like mm -hmm. about to kind of like call out for like, hey, up yep. here. But yep. then he, but then Michelle just like walks out like without hesitation, mm -hmm. stabs this guy in the gut. A hundred percent. It's like my cover is blown because I had to kill Henri. And I also love that he was really, I don't want to say strategic, but there's something more calculating about luring someone out into a lake where you can fake a murder to make it look like drowning, even right. though obviously he didn't do it well enough that the police didn't get suspicious. But this is panic, right? Like that's kind of why I think maybe ramir was actually his first murder because the way he's reacting running around stabbing an inspector in the woods you're going to get caught for this oh yeah absolutely but we'll never know because no. <laughs> the movie's about to end but we get this extended sequence oh boy i tried to watch this movie during the day for this and i had to pause it because i literally couldn't see anything because folks we also didn't mention in addition to basically only using natural sounds, they use natural light. We're also using natural light. So we can barely see anything because it is pitch black in these scenes. And it's really spooky. It's like you are playing I spy horror here because you mm -hmm. know that Michelle is here. 
he is gaslighting to the max saying you know Franck come out I want us to be together we can date we can do romantic things and <sighs> then we see Franck and he's kind of standing there and you're waiting to see if there's going to be a fight and well because I kept thinking that Michelle was going to like just jump out. We're gonna get not, sure. not a jump scare per se, but like, I, like oh he he's near him. He's gonna grab him and yeah, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a fight. It's gonna be a tussle. Somebody's gonna get stabbed. But no, 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 no. We don't get that. Mm-hmm. What do we get, Joe? <laughs> we get ambiguity because we just go to credits, bitches. Well, okay. Frank stands up and mm-hmm. then just starts calling out Michelle's name. Yeah, it's it's like the. The harder version of he's going out to swim with Michelle, even though he knows what happened, mm-hmm. what Michelle does in the water. It yeah, is he's still choosing this sexual relationship, even though there is no denying it. You cannot say that like, oh, Henri just tripped and fell on a sharp well, rock and slit his own throat. That's that's what makes it the most. And again, I'm saying it's frustrating. It's not it's not a knock against the movie, because, again, this is the whole point of the whole thing. Mm-hmm. But it was more forgivable, kind of earlier because he didn't know this fucker that he murdered whatever sure. fine he's never gonna do this to me um mm-hmm. he killed like your like really maybe not your best friend but like one of your best friends on this beach <laughs> yes. yeah and he didn't even hesitate to kill the inspector and you could argue oh well he doesn't have a relationship with either two of those people he won't do that to me but that's the lie we tell ourselves yes and then we pay the price for it yes 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 so okay going in into these all right so there are two Kind of alternate. It's like endings. the same one with like slightly different footage. Yeah. So basically, what happens is the first one is just an extension, right? We we play it. He he calls out for Michelle's name. He's kind of standing there, and again, the way it's framed, it's Franck in center frame, and he's just staring off to screen right. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, Michelle's gonna come up behind him and like slit his throat or something, right? No. What happens is Michelle walks up from screen right, and then they just start rubbing each other all over. Mm -hmm. And then Michelle's like, we shouldn't stay here. And then they walk away, cut to black. Yeah, it doesn't really do much for me. So I didn't like this one. Well, see, okay, the second one's basically the same one, except Mm -hmm. we hear more of Michelle calling out to Frank, being like, we can we can spend the night together. We're so Mm -hmm. happy together. So it makes him more pathetic, which I actually did like. Oh, see, I don't think that's pathetic. I think that's him being a mastermind and saying, I know this is what's going to get Franck to reveal himself because it's what he's been wanting all along. Hey, wait, so do you think he's going to kill Franck right now? Or do you think he's going to wait until he's like, until he finds someone else? Oh, I think he's going to kill him now. Interesting. All right, see, based on the the extended endings, Mm -hmm. I was actually thinking he was going to kill him later. But with well, the ending we have, mm-hmm. with the ending we have in the movie, I'm like, I mean, the fucking... ending we have in the movie, it's definitely right here, right now. Yeah. And then I think you're right that he maybe leads him away and he'll kill him later. But there's no scenario. Like, obviously, we don't see any ending. That's why it's yeah. amb- ambiguous. But I don't think there's a situation where Frank gets out of this alive. No, no, no. I just didn't think he was going to kill him tonight. I thought it was going to be like, because I, 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 I guess... What you're viewing is masterminding to trick him to coming out of his hiding place. I'm mm-hmm. kind of like, no, I think he's still like, I think he's like delusional where he's like, no, I can make this happen. Like, blah, blah, blah. Right. But then he will eventually <laughs> get tired of this guy. For sure. Yeah. It's until the next twink comes along. 100%. Because that, that, and that's why I view him as pathetic because I'm like, oh, he's so closed off emotionally. He probably doesn't even know why he kills people. Or, I mean, he's a sociopath, whatever. Mm-hmm. But I, I do sometimes believe that he really thinks at some point that, oh, he can make this work, but it's, it's never going to happen because of who he is. Right. Interesting. I don't know. But, um, but that's yeah. it. Yeah, that, that, that is Stranger by the Lake. Any more like things to add before we close this out, Joe? I guess the the big thing for me is how many different queer conversations this film is having. Like, you can suggest it's talking about body image problems. You can say it's talking about cruising, the fleeting nature of relationships, the value of queer friendships. At what point does queer desire become a death warrant? We're having conversations about AIDS and STIs. Like, for me, this is one of the most vital queer horror texts that have come out in the last 20 years. Yeah, this and Knife Plus Heart, both French. Yeah. Both <laughs> fucking French. Yeah, Um. no, I mean, again, this is the first time watch for me, and I did not disappoint. Uh, I watched it two days ago, and I rewatched it again today when I was cooking, and it's it's just, it's really sat with me, you know? Um, mm-hmm. It's it's not action-oriented, it's not a hack-and-slash movie, but no. it's, it is very suspenseful, and that, that documentary style, I just, you know, it... it 
it makes it that much more unsettling. Well, it's weird, too, because we haven't really commented, but it's also exceedingly gorgeous. Like, it makes me want to go to the beach and go on vacation, which is the opposite of what the narrative is actually telling me. And I love that kind of, like, the visual aesthetic is so alluring. And then the narrative is like, no, bitch, you in danger. The color of the water changes so many times in this film, but, like, there's parts where it's, like, aqua blue, and I'm just Mm -hmm. like, oh, I want to go there so bad. (laughs) Do a little skinny dipping. Yeah, absolutely. And you can join me. (laughs) Uh, uh... (laughs) Body issues, schmoddy issues. (laughs) (laughs) You know what? I love our friendship in a non-sexual way. Um, Didn't we just discuss that you can be nude with friends and it can be platonic? Yeah, and then you said your friend got a hard dick, and then you went and had like a game. No, that day. wasn't a fr- no, that wasn't a friend. That was a random guy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my friend was there, and he also got hard. But I mean, whatever. <laughs> and this guy's name was Michelle. It was the weirdest thing. Anyway, all right, everyone. Before we announce what we're covering next week, if you want to get in touch with us, you can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at horrorqueers. Shoot us an email at horrorqueers at gmail dot com. Find us on Letterbox to keep track of all the films we've covered go to our youtube channel to check out our interviews with various horror filmmakers and tune in once a month to hear about our most anticipated horror films for that month if you want to chat with other listeners please join our facebook horror queers group if you have a moment please rate and review us on apple podcasts or spotify and if you want even more content please support the show by becoming a patron folks i'm taking over this week as promised So, subscribe today for 264 hours of Patreon content, including this month's new episodes on The Voyeurs, A Haunting in Venice, The Nun 2, as well as two audio commentaries, one on Underworld and the other on Saw 2. And that's how you do it. So, yeah. Well... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> For the record, sometimes I have to describe what the movies are because I don't think everyone knows what these movies are all the time. <laughs> uh, you know what? I would give it to you for some of the lower releases. But when you say things like A Haunting in Venice, the new installment in the Hercule Poirot franchise, <laughs> you're like, bitch, okay. you can't even say the name correctly. Okay, Shut wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I said Hercule Poirot, but I, I, will ha- Hercule Poirot. I will have you know that after I got out of my screening for Haunting in Venice, uh, mm-hmm. a friend texted me and was like, how was the movie? And I was like, well, I was like, what do you think of the other two? And he goes, what other two? <laughs> <laughs> uh, admittedly, I did have lunch with my husband after my screening. And I was like, yeah, it's the new Kenneth Branagh Hercule Poirot. And he was like, who? And I was like, Agatha Christie, like super famous detective. He was like, nope. <laughs> So no young people are going to see these movies. It's all old people. <laughs> oh, this is 100% an old person moneymaker. Folks, if you want to hear it, go on to Patreon. It should be there now. All right. Well, Joe, so we are finished with Erotic Thriller Month, and we are moving into October next week. Oh, yeah. What are we talking about? Well, this is actually really exciting, Trace, because it's not just the beginning of October. It's also a milestone episode. We're celebrating 250 baby oh shit i did not i totally didn't know that (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) now those numbers add up uh (laughs) how are we celebrating (laughs) so we're going to talk about i think a favorite of both of ours this is a film i've been so eager to revisit because to me it's such a symbolic representation of halloween so i'm very excited we're going to talk about Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow. Oh, uh, I'm so, I just got this fucking 4K too, so I'm really excited to have a reason to watch it. But um nice. yeah, I, I think this is possibly Tim Burton's last legitimately great film. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I I would probably agree with that, unfortunately. Uh, admittedly, I haven't seen Big Eyes, and I think Big Fish is fine. But um yeah. I'm really excited, everyone. Uh Christina Ricci. What a goose! Um <laughs> All right. Until next week, everyone, we can cross out Stranger by the Lake. Oh, my God. I was like, what is he doing? Is he pretending that people don't know what Sleepy Hollow is now? No, I just love when the Miranda Richards is like, what's a goose? (laughs) See, I don't even get that reference. So I need to rewatch. Oh, my God. Clearly. But um, yeah, we can cross out horror queers. Our Atlas Avenue, a long stretch of road that encompasses everything the city of Kennet Heights has to offer. Neon lights, 
traffic, crime, the hustle and bustle of everyday life, and the craziest of characters. My office was above it all. My name is James Locke, and I'm a P.I. Hello, Mr. J. How the hell you doing today? Good, Edith. Nearly every year I have a new case. New people to meet, new clues to discover, and new problems to solve. But I do it the old-fashioned way. No technology. Nothing post-1950. Hell, I don't even listen to podcasts, but you should. Atlas Avenue Beat is a spoof of the film noir genre with goofy characters, tons of wordplay, and non-stop raunchy humor. There's also three whole seasons out right now with more on the way. Just search for Atlas Avenue Beat wherever you listen to podcasts or visit us online at bloody.fm.